Got a secret, can you keep it? I know you want to kiss me. Hello everybody, welcome to Mike's Mike. My name is Factually, Contractually and Legally Mike and welcome to the third and final part of my Pretty Little Liars plot recap series. It's actually kind of sad now that I think about it that this series is ending because I genuinely had a lot of fun making it. It took three months, but all good things must come to an end. And that's what we are here to do today to end all the good things. In this video, I'll be covering season six and seven. So episodes 121 to 160, and then I'll give some best and worst and just some thoughts on how I would have liked the series to end. In terms of what I'm going to be doing next on my channel after this PLL series, this was a bit of a test to see if a pivot into long form content would work. And I think it has been successful. So keep an eye out for more long videos this year. At the moment, I'm thinking one long video and one short video per month. As always, thank you for watching my videos and feel free to leave me a like and a comment. It truly does help. Alrighty, let's do a check-in of where everyone is at the end of episode 121. Remember episodes 120 and 121 were the dollhouse episodes. And if you didn't know that because you didn't watch part one and two, I would suggest going to do that because it's an insane amount of spoilers from here on in. Starting with Miss Pretty Little Liar herself, Alison de Laurentiis, she was most recently accused of murdering Mona Vanderwall, but the police realized that Mona was in fact alive after seeing her on the surveillance cameras in the dollhouse in the Campbell Farm barn. In 121, Allison worked with Caleb and Ezra to work out where the dollhouse was and eventually rescue the girls. Jessica De Laurentiis is very much not alive. Um, she was found buried in the Hastings backyard at the start of season five and we don't know at this point who did it, but we will find out. This thing is making my hand so sweaty. Kenneth is a flop. Jason De Laurentiis fell down an elevator shaft in season three, which was very iconic. Um, he didn't really do much for season four. And then in season five, he came back and slept with Ashley Marin. We found out that Bethany Young was the dead girl in Allison's grave and she should absolutely have a cross on her because that menace is not coming back. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. Also in terms of Miss Bethany's death, we know that she was hit with a shovel and then she was buried alive by Melissa Hastings, who thought that Spencer had killed Allison, but we don't know who actually hit Bethany with a shovel. That Melissa Spencer burying plotline, yeah, that's iconic, that's history. Peter and Veronica worked with Caleb and Ezra to find the girls in the dollhouse, so they know everything about A. Let's do the four main girls together for this next bit. The four girls were accused of being accessories to Mona's murder and on their way to prison, were kidnapped and put in the dollhouse, where they found Mona, who had actually been in there for like five months or something. In the dollhouse, you know, Aid does a little bit of torture, a little bit of torture for like three weeks. And while they're down there, they find out that A's identity is Charles De Laurentiis. But they're like, who is that? We've never heard of that person before. Remember, this is A for this arc. They also found old footage of Jessica De Laurentiis at the Campbell farm with baby Allison, young Jason, and another boy who they assume is Charles. All right, back to individual updates. In seasons three to five, I said that Troyan as Spencer was serving Oscars and it was true. But let me tell you, in season six and season seven, she is serving knighthood in acting. Dame Troy and Belisario. I mean, besides Dame Janelle Parrish as Mona Vanderwalt, nobody's touching her. These two elite. Toby Kavanagh in season five, he went to Instant Police Academy for three weeks, printed an accreditation, and he is now fully on the police force. Melissa most recently confessed to Spencer via video recording that she was the one that buried Bethany alive. And now I think she's sliving in London with Ren. Melissa and Ren are on and off, but at this point they're both in London at least. Jenna Marshall hasn't really made much of an impact since her girlfriend Shana fell one meter off a stage in the Fitzgerald Theater in New York and died. But we did find out that Jenna's new bestie is flop new character to Sydney, whatever. Ian Thomas died in the season one finale after he tried to kill Spencer by pushing her off the bell tower, but he got pushed off the bell tower by someone in a black hoodie. We find out in season four that that was actually Miss Alison de Laurentiis. Detective Garrett Reynolds was murdered by Detective Darren Wilden on the Halloween train in season three. Truly breathtaking episode, one for the history books. Arya murdered Shana when she pushed Shana off that stage in the season five premiere, and Shana was initially trying to murder the entire squad. I don't think she really thought that through. Like she had high goals and she achieved none of them. We also found out that Shana was childhood friends with Allison, knew she was alive and was helping her while she was dead slash disappeared. Sarah Harvey. Let me mind my business. We last saw Sarah being pulled out of the dollhouse by the police on a stretcher. And it looks like she's been down there since she was kidnapped. She went missing the same weekend that Allison did. Linda Tanner is the Rosewood Police Department. She doesn't trust the girls as she shouldn't. She just led the investigation to get them out of the dollhouse. Emily danced to bang bang. Nate killed Maya, tried to kill Paige, stabbed Caleb and Emily killed Nate. Paige has been iced out of the squad after trying to start shit about Emily helping Allison post-resurrection. We found out that there were two Redcoats, 
Allison and Cece. Speaking of Cece, we found out in the season five premiere that she's the one that murdered Wilden and then she escaped to Paris. We didn't see her at all in season five except for the terrifyingly terrible Christmas episode. She appeared for that and then I guess went back to Paris. Pepe the dog dug up Jessica de Laurentiis. Tippy gave the performance of the lifetime with the board shorts, Grunwald, Ravenswood plotline. Wow, we have come so far. Ah uh, yes, board shorts. We found out that board shorts was felon Ezra Fitz, felon Fitz, Ezra Flops. He was dating underage Allison and then when she went missing he started writing a book about her and her friends started dating Arya as research and then fell in love Ezra was shot in the season four finale by Shana and by the end of season five he is fully back in with the squad when he really should be in a maximum security prison Andrew Campbell had a little fling with Arya Montgomery but now he is suspect number one for being Charles de Laurentiis and a huge piece of evidence in that is the dollhouse surveillance equipment found at the Campbell family farm barn. Byron and Ella, yeah, whatever. Mike Montgomery was dating Mona and he was across the whole Mona is dead plan. Noel Kahn knew that Allison was alive and was apparently actually helping her. Sure, whatever. Oh, my bestie, Mrs. Grunwaldsty. She was most recently spotted when Hannah asked her to use her psychic sleigh powers to find out where Mona's body was buried. And she said that Mona is cold and surrounded by dirt. Thanks lady. Mona was actually in the dollhouse. Grunwald flopped, I'm afraid. She sold zero units. Mona Vanderwall died in the season five mid-season finale, but it turned out she used her own blood to fake her death so that she could do a deal with A to frame Allison for her death. And the purpose of this was to find out who A was, but it didn't work out and she was captured and put in the dollhouse for like five months and forced to pretend to be Allison. Mona's story is just so good. Ugh, like ugh, it's sickening how good it is. Lucas didn't really sell any units in part two. Darren Wilden was run over by Ashley Marin, helped by Shana and Jenna, and then shot dead by Cece Drake. Caleb was a reincarnated teenager from 1918 for a little bit in season four. And then when Ravenswood flopped and he came back to Pretty Little Liars full time, he nearly died by being locked in a walk-in furnace. I mean, what a sentence. He most recently worked with Ezra and Allison to get the girls out of the dollhouse. Ashley is engaged to Ted. I think that's everyone now. It is now time for us to do season six. Just take a quick look at the wall. The green lines, the light green lines are the season six lines. Remember, I have actually talked about episode one of season six already because it was part two of the dollhouse eleganza extravaganza. So we're actually starting with episode two of season six or episode 122 overall. Arya, Spencer, Hannah and Emily are in the hospital recovering from the torture in the dollhouse. We don't at this point know what the torture was, but we know it was bad because they go to their rooms they scream and then it cuts to three weeks later. In the hospital, they're talking about how all signs point to Andrew being Charles and Arya is the number one supporter of that theory. Like, sis is convinced. The other queens, however, they're skeptical. We cut to police officer Toby tackling Andrew and beating him up and Andrew's like, um, I'm literally innocent. What are you doing? And Toby doesn't give a shit. He's in clown mode. He's literally beating up a suspect, but I guess he didn't learn how to be a proper police officer during his three weeks at policeacademy.com. New character alert. Lorenzo is Toby's police partner. He sees this happening. He says, do your job. And then Andrew's arrested. Allison asks Kenneth if there's a Charles de Laurentiis in the family and Kenneth's like, mm, 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 no. In hospital, Emily talks to Sarah Harvey. At this point, they hadn't had any interaction with Miss Sarah. Sarah tells her she ran away from home, was hit in the head in a car park near Rosewood and woke up in the dollhouse, but doesn't know anything about what Charles looks like. Some time passes and the girls are at a hospital, but they're having dollhouse flashbacks triggered by being back in their real rooms. Remember their dollhouse rooms were pretty much exact replicas of their real rooms, but the doors were all locked and the windows would open to concrete. Because that shit was underground. Like A had the budget and had the time to build that shit. Like A was pissed. Hannah's not having a bar of this and decides to completely redo her room. So she pulls off the wallpaper and sells all her furniture. Veronica has barred Spencer from taking anxiety medication because she's worried that it will trigger her drug addiction. Without the medication, Spencer can't sleep and she's having flashbacks to being in the dollhouse, being strapped to a desk with three switches with each of the girl's faces on them. And she has to pick which person to torture. We also find out from Hannah that A made them play games such as who deserves water more today, you or someone else? Which is pretty fucked. Emily finds her dad's gun locker in the attic and goes to the shooting range for a cute little rage release. Pam finds out and she's like, um, you literally cannot do that. My immediate thought is how was Miss Girl even let into the gun range in the first place? Like, wouldn't the person who was working at the gun range recognize who she was? Like, Rosewood's not that big of a town and she was one of the five girls that literally was abducted and kept underground in a bunker 
for three weeks, hello. Also no shade, but Emily has literally killed someone and has been accused of killing someone else. So wouldn't she be on some kind of list? In terms of Arya, every single plot line with her revolves around who she's dating. And it's pretty much always like Arya and Ezra, drama, what's happening? Basically at this point, these two aren't really seeing each other and I don't think they are for the rest of season 6A. Arya goes to the police station and they ask her if she ever actually saw that Andrew was her captor in the dollhouse and she lies and says that she did. She's so sure that it was him and she just wants this shit to be over with. Allison meets Lorenzo at church and they have flirty vibes. Boo, boo, tomato, tomato, embarrassing. It's another inappropriate police officer high school girl relationship. Like at this point, it's just ridiculous. Also, why can't these characters be single for more than two episodes? Like Alison went missing, came back, was convicted of murder. Someone else tried to kill her, blah, blah, blah. Like maybe she just needs time to herself. Also, what is with the obsession with police officers being specifically interested in Alison? We had Wilden, Holbrook, and now Lorenzo. Oh my God, there's also this other plot line of Toby telling Spencer to tell Alison to leave Lorenzo alone because she's bad news. How about you tell your colleague to stay away from high school girls? Emily sees Sarah lurking around her house and she's like, um, WTF, thought you went home, LOL. And Sarah's like, I did, but my mum is shit. And I think she likes the attention of me being back more than me actually being back, which is pretty sad. Emily offers that Sarah stay with her and Pam. Speaking of Pam and the parents, like, yes, they are concerned, but I honestly don't think it's enough concern for the fact that they were just kidnapped and tortured in a dollhouse replica of their real rooms for three weeks. Also, Mona was gone for five months. In episode three, Andrew is officially cleared of all charges after the Rosewood flop lease to Flopman find out he actually had an alibi. Also, all the scenes of him being shady and monitoring people's phone calls and everything are apparently because he was trying to do his own private investigation and work out who kidnapped the girls. It doesn't really make sense, but whatever. At this point, we can't be choosy, right? My man Andrew right here, he was set up. The writers said, we cannot have this nice male character just be a nice male character. We need to give him a crusty edge. When Arya and the girls see him, she's like, oh my God, sorry for saying that we saw you in the dollhouse. Andrew says, and I quote, other towns have nice toxic dumps. Rosewood has you. <sighs> Like he was so right for that. We never see Andrew again, by the way. I hope he's doing well. At this point, you might be like, where's Dame Janelle Parrish as Mona Vanderwall? Well, apparently her mum took her out of Rosewood um, as some R&R. &R. You know, you were trapped in this underground dollhouse for five months. Let's go to a spa. In episode three, Sarah Harvey has two showers. And I'm mentioning that because when the episodes were coming out, I remember there was a running joke that she was called Shower Harvey because of her shower to non-shower screen time ratio. Now things are gonna start picking up. Spencer asks Jason if he knows anything about his potential brother, Charles De Laurentiis, and Jason looks really confused. And he says, Charlie doesn't exist. Charlie. Dun, dun, dun. Turns out as a child, Jason had an imaginary friend called Charlie. And one day Kenneth told Jason that Charlie had to go away, but Charlie was Charles and Charles was very much real. And Kenneth and Jessica gaslit Jason into thinking that his brother was an imaginary friend. So how's that for a masterclass in parenting? Il Dottore Sullivan, she's back. And they're about to talk to her about the dollhouse and the Jason discovery when Emily gets a video of Sarah sleeping and someone with black gloves holding a knife above her, basically implying if they tell anyone anything, Sarah dies. Back at the Deswang Renters household, the girl's looking for proof of Charles and they find a photo from the Campbell Farm barn day that has Jessica with baby Allison and the two boys. The girls also find out by talking to each other that those torture games weren't entirely real. You know, when they had to pick a switch for which person to torture, which person to electric shock, that kind of thing. The girls never got shocked. It was all just mind games. A was just pushing them to see how much pressure it would take for them to start hurting each other. It's cooked, like this is ABC Family, like, huh? Allison and Jason confront Kenneth with the photo. What is this? That's what da da <laughs> what da da what da da They confront him with the photo and he tells them that Charles is their brother, was 15 months older than Jason and that he was bad news evil child and it wasn't safe to have him around baby Allison. So they had him institutionalized at Radley when Allison was one. Also, apparently they moved to Rosewood after Charles was put in Radley, which explains why no one around town knows anything about Charles. Jason is fucking furious. He's absolutely fuming about how Kenneth and Jessica lied to him and gaslit him into thinking Charlie's not real. And rightly so. Allison tells Kenneth that she thinks Charles is the one that kidnapped the girls and put them in the dollhouse. And Kenneth is like, mm, mm, mm. Charles is dead. Apparently Charles committed S word when he was 16 at Radley. Kenneth was out of town on business 
and Jessica had Charles cremated. When Allison tells the girls that Charles is dead, they're like, um, no body, no crime, no candle, no light. They think there's a possibility he could have faked his death and could still be alive, so they need proof that he died. We also find out around episode three, episode four, that Radley has closed down. Sarah has another shower in episode four, and she also has a Katy Perry witness moment because she cuts and bleaches her hair into like a platinum blonde pixie cut. In episode four, we meet Sabrina, who is the new baker at the brew, and she gives Spencer weed brownies to help Spencer sleep. Spencer has a flashback to being in her room in the dollhouse, waking up on the floor, and she's covered in blood. And there's like a pool of blood on the floor, and then a trail of blood out past her locked door, implying that she killed someone while in the dollhouse. At this point, Radley shut down, right? The girls break into a facility that stores Radley records and find Charles's file that stops when he was 16, but also says that the only two people to ever visit him were Jessica and Aunt Carol, mother dearest Jessica. The girls tell Jason about this and he remembers how after he fell down the elevator shaft, he went to hide at Aunt Carol's and when he was there, he found Jessica who was really surprised to see him and wouldn't let him into the house. He heard a noise coming from the house, but Jessica said it was nothing, but now he thinks that maybe Jessica was hiding Charles in Aunt Carol's house. Back in present day, Hannah, Spencer, Jason and Allie go to Aunt Carol's to find some Charles evidence and they find Charles's gravestone. So this means that Jessica lied about cremating him. Also now their working theory is that someone Charles was at Radley with is impersonating him since he's dead. Aria has a flashback to waking up in the dollhouse with a haircut and an A message telling her to dye it back to, you know, that like pink streak sleigh post Iceland pre season one. It's a little bit funny because Aria wakes up with a haircut and some hair dye <laughs> and Spencer wakes up covered in blood and made to think she killed someone. And we're supposed to think that those two things are equivalent. I'm not saying that Aria's situation isn't traumatizing. She was probably drugged and then someone cut her hair in her sleep without her consent, but it's not really on the same level. Also in episode four, Aria meets a photography friend named Clark. Hannah and Caleb, hashtag Caleb for the shippers out there. They're showing signs of breaking up again because Hannah doesn't like how Caleb's treating her as if she'll break at any second and not giving her space. Get this right, the end of episode scene reveals that A has trackers on all of the girls that must have been implanted when they woke up on the operation tables in the dollhouse, remember that? So that's definitely fucked, right? They were gassed and then they woke up on a table with trackers in their necks. Cool, cool, cool. Um, episode five starts with Maddie Ziegler dancing in the Radley basement. I'm not joking, I'm dead serious. What's happening is that Spencer is having a dream that involves Maddie Ziegler dancing in the Radley basement. Empty chair to a solo. Now that I think about it, it's actually giving Sia cheap thrills like sanitarium edition. Mona is back, thank God you're here. She's scared, she'll panicking. She's worried that the police are gonna charge her for faking her death and all the money and resources that were wasted on that case. We also see fucking Leslie again. Miss Leslie right here. I'm very anti Leslie. Leslie was in season five and I completely ignored her plotline because it didn't really add much to the story. And again, I'm not really gonna talk about her for season six, but I did put her on the wall because she has a part in the show. The only good thing about the Leslie plotline is that Arya nearly gets attacked by a raccoon in episode six. No further questions. Thank you Leslie for that. Back in episode five, Arya and new photography bestie Clark are taking really shit, really bad photos of like dolls in a junkyard. And Clark takes a picture of Arya and you can actually see A in the background. When Arya sees this photo, she's like, oh, MFG, because it's A's side profile and there's a bust. My coconuts, bum bum, be dum bum bum, sorry. In other news, Caleb offers Sarah a job at his um, web design company so that she can get emancipated. Sorry, when did this web design company happen? Like, when did you have time to do that? But also like, come on side hustle. We love multiple streams of income. Emily and Sarah also get tattoos. Hannah and Spencer break into abandoned Radley to get more Charles information. And they find out that Charles's organs were donated after he died. At this point, I'm personally like, you're getting so much Charles information. You should absolutely take this to the police. But the whole thing is they can't tell the police about Charles or else Sarah gets rocked. So rock it. Like it sounds bad, but hun, you came in season six of a seven season show, like you are disposable. In episode six, Mona is so Apple Store genius bar because she says, look at the medication Charles was taking. No one would want his liver. So it sounds like the organ donor proof of death info is fake. Also, the girls are being horrible to Mona. Idiots, for what? Mona literally faked her death to help find out who your stalker is. And then she got put in a hole 
in the dollhouse when trying to help you escape. Also another plot point from the forbidden Leslie plot lines is Mona finding out that the night Ali disappeared, two people escaped from Radley, Bethany and Charles. Turns out Leslie was at Radley too, but just forget about that, forget about it, it's not important. You just need to know that Charles potentially isn't dead and escaped Radley the same night Bethany did, which is the same night Alison disappeared. Next we meet Nicole Gordon. Nicole worked with Emily in Haiti a couple of years ago and offers Emily a spot in her new squad that's gonna help people in Thailand. Emily says no, no, because she can't leave her new bestie Sarah behind. Episode six ends with Kenneth digging up Charles's grave at Aunt Carol's house, and it looks like Charles has sent him a birthday card that says, Dear Daddy, coming home for my birthday, you should plan a party to die for, just you, love Charles. Drama. Terrible episode though, so bad. This is the one with the raccoons. In episode 7, Hannah gets a $30,000 scholarship from the Karasimi group, which Ashley says is the group Jessica used to donate to all the time. After doing some research on the Karasimi group website, she discovers that they donated to Radley a lot, and the girls are like, hmm, maybe Karasimi group was founded by Jessica, as a way for her to put money aside for Charles. There's also this whole plot line in episode seven that is like this birthday, hang on, let me just read it. Jason orchestrates a meetup with Charles at his birthday party, but it goes south and the police turn up, including Toby, but Toby accidentally ate one of Spencer's weed brownies, so he's spaced out when he tries to catch Charles. Like he saw the bag of brownies in Spencer's bag and thought, yeah, cool, I'll take those without asking. You get what you deserve. Also, the girls do surgery on each other to remove the trackers from their necks, giving a little bit of Grey's Anatomy, you know? Things have really taken a turn since season one. Anyway, in episode eight, Aria is a finalist in a photography competition for her absolutely atrocious, disgraceful photos of the dolls in the junkyard. Like, I'm sorry, these photos are so bad. Everyone's like, oh my God, these are the best photos I have ever seen. And I'm just like, these are criminal. Spencer and Hannah, they actually get a lot of scenes together in season six. They go to the Karasimi group office and meet Reese Matthews, who looks a lot like a De Laurentiis. So they're like, it's him, that's Charles. It's not. In the Karasimi group office, they also see this suspicious locked room. Also at this point you find out that Ezra and Nicole are floaty vibes after Nicole met him that time she came looking for Emily to invite her to the Habitat for Humanity Thailand Extravaganza Eleganza Ball. Turns out he, Ezra Flops himself, is thinking of doing this Habitat for Humanity trip. In episode nine, the girls are pissed. They are pissed because they're banned from going to their senior prom. It is very much fair that they can't go because a murderous kidnapper is trying to re-kidnap them and by them going to the school prom or whatever, they're gonna endanger the entire school cohort. So I am team teacher on this. Allison, however, gets a text from A saying, better be at prom, it's our last chance to dance. Come alone, XO Charles. Also just quickly, for episode nine, I wrote in my notes that this was actually a pretty good episode. So I think this was one of my favorites of season six. The girls are having their own version of prom in the Hastings barn with the mum's chaperoning. Aria invited Ezra, boo. Hannah invited Caleb, slay. Spencer invited Toby, boo. Emily invited Sarah, tomato, tomato, but she says, I can't go. Now there is a lot of PLL mum content in the next two episodes. And basically every scene involving the mums involves them drinking wine. If the PLL mums are gonna do anything, it's drink wine. There's a scene where Veronica accidentally spills the tea on Jason being Peter's son and also spills her wine. And she says, oops, I spilled, oops. I spilled. At the little makeshift prom in the barn, the girls are looking at their classmates' prom photos on Facebook and see Ali in the background and work out she must be going to meet Charles. The girls sneak off to the prom to find her. Meanwhile, the mums are talking about how Jessica was buried in the Hastings backyard and suggest that maybe Kenneth killed her. A drunk Veronica decides that they should go next door and confront him about it. When they get to the De Laurentiis house, the front door is unlocked but no one is home. They go and look for Kenneth, hear a noise in the basement and get locked in. Blah, blah, blah. The mums are trapped in the basement. That's important. That is so important. That's like the most important thing in the show. Now back at prom, Emily runs into Sarah. So now it's the eight of them running around trying to find Allison and trying to find Charles. The girls see Allison running off and Clark of all characters, Clark is running after her. Bit of context, Clark is there as the event photographer. Um, Clark pulls out a gun. They think that he's an A-team henchman. Turns out he's an undercover police officer. Goodbye. The end of the episode is Allison running and screaming, where are you taking me? To Charles, who turns, takes his mask off, and we see Allison saying, oh my God. All right, season six finale titled Game Over Charles. This is one of the biggest episodes 
in the entire show. Not gonna say one of the best, but it's one of the biggest for sure. We get a massive A reveal. We're still at prom, the girls are with their dates and they're all looking for Alison and Charles. Dame Janelle Parrish as Mona Vanderwall turns up and says she's been tracking Alison since the day before and knew that Alison was getting texts from Charles and has discovered that Charles has his own cellular network with servers based in the Karasimi group. They're all like, okay, swag. Let's go to the Karasimi group then. Now this is important. Sarah tells the girls she'll call Tanner to tell Tanner what's happening. So basically alerting the police to what they're doing. Let me get the sweaty stick back. Allison wakes up in a Radley room with pictures of her family all over the walls and Kenneth and Jason seemingly laying dead on the floor outside the room. The girls arrive at the Karasimi group, guess the password to that secret room that I was telling you about before and boom, they're in A's lair. Now this lair, it is extremely futuristic and I'm afraid to say I'm a Hater. There's like a giant tablet touch screen and a hologram screen. Why is A giving Iron Man Tony Stark slay? It's just sick and twisted that 99% of this show tries to be realistic and then that 1% is a psychic lady from Ravenswood and a fake charity run by an undead De Laurentiis that has a Tony Stark Iron Man lair with touch screens and holograms in it. Anyway, the door to the Iron Man lair shuts and the girls, excluding Sarah, are trapped in there. The hologram screen turns on and the girls can see Allison in the Radley room saying, why would you kill them? Charles says, don't be so dramatic, Ali. Turns around. Charles is, drum roll please. Da -da 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 CC Drake. Now the girls in the Iron Man Tony Stark lair Avengers Tower, they are flabbergasted. Absolute fucking scenes at the investment group headquarters. Arya asks the hologram screen what CC is planning and CC turns to a camera and says, Lord help the mister who comes between me and my sister. So based on that, Spencer's like, <gasps> CC thinks that we stole Ali from her. The girls are suddenly like, wait, shouldn't the police be here? Sarah called Tanner. And Mona's like, no, she never made the call. T. More on that later. Okay, so now it's time for a CC story time trending to have 3 million views in a day, so strap in. CC says that she never did anything to hurt Allison when Ali was a baby and that it was all a misunderstanding. We go into flashbacks. Kenneth thinks that Charles was trying to drown Ali. False. Charles was actually trying to give Allison a bath to cheer her up. We're still in flashbacks, by the way. We see Jessica and Kenneth dropping Charles off at Radley. Jessica is upset, but Kenneth Flop is not. Present day Cece says she thinks Kenneth knew it was an accident, but went through with the Radley lockup because he didn't like how Charles would ask Jessica for dresses and play dress up in her closet. Cece says that Kenneth never came to Radley to visit once. So in summary, Kenneth is A, say it with me, toxic flop. Cece tells Ali that Kenneth and Jason aren't actually dead and Mona realizes this is what happened to her when we saw her body in the car boot in the season five mid-season finale. It's sort of like they're temporarily paralyzed but can still hear everything. Just reminiscing on how bad my life was when I thought that Mona was dead. Like that was, it was a bad time for me. Like that's my bestie, I'm sorry. Cece says that Jessica would visit as much as she could but it was pretty much solitary confinement for like seven years. When Charles turned 12, Jessica bought him a yellow dress and from then on, whatever Jessica bought Allison, she bought a duplicate for Charles. Ding, 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 important. Time for another flashback. Charles is in a dress on the Radley rooftop with Bethany Young. Now Miss Bethany? I think she's the real villain of the series. Charles and Bethany are having cutesy chats on the rooftop and who walks onto the roof? Mmm, Marion Kavanagh, Toby's mother. Not the easy access to the rooftop for the patients in Radley Sanitarium. Like the fact that patients can just get up there so easily, that seems like an issue. Charles is worried that Marion's gonna see him in a dress. So he asks Bethany for help. And when he says help, he means, can you go distract Marion while I hide? Bethany walks up to Marion and pushes her off the roof. I don't think there were any barriers or balustrades or anything like, come on rooftop safety. Charles is like, what did you do? And Bethany says, and I quote, what did I do? You pushed her, freak. Present day Cece says that no one would believe a boy in a dress saying that Bethany did it. So Charles got blamed and Jessica paid off Wilden to write off Marion's death as an S word. Now this is starting to tie into what we found out in season three and four. Now because of crusty Bethany's lies, Charles was incorrectly diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder and giving medication that nearly killed him. Apparently the doctors felt bad and let Charles out for a funeral 
his funeral. Now, after Charles died and that death was documented, Jessica accepted Charlotte or Cece as her daughter. So my understanding here is that almost everyone thought Charles died and only Jessica and the people in Radley knew Charlotte's history and Radley helped Charlotte's transition because they felt bad for almost killing her with the medications from the incorrect diagnosis. It's not explicitly said that that's what happens, but if you put all the pieces together, I think that is what happens. Now back in the Iron Man lair, don't forget the girls are in Avengers Tower right now. The girls see a motion sensor go off and from a camera feed see someone in a red coat in a hall in Radley. I'm gonna fucking scream. But wait, wasn't there two red coats, Ali and Cece? Mm -mm. There's actually three. Spencer puts one and two together to equal three and she realizes that Cece and red coat are gonna blow up Radley. Here's that third red coat. And I realized that we should probably put a cross on Marion as well. Okay, back to flashbacks. Charlotte goes mega slay maths mode and Radley grants her permission to attend classes at UPenn. One day she calls in a bomb threat so class would get canceled and she can go see Jason for the first time at Rosewood High. Jason is there taking his yearbook photo and they have a little convo. Remember, Jason doesn't know Cece's past. And he asks Cece if she goes to Rosewood High and she says she doesn't. Plot hole. Someone please sound the plot hole alarm. When Cece is introduced in season three, Spencer finds her in the Rosewood yearbook and her entry says prom queen, drama and debate club. So how are you gonna be prom queen if you never went to the school? Her school visit to Jason landing on photo day does work as an explanation as to why she has a photo in the first place. But prom queen makes no sense. Did no one else in that class see that? Think who the fuck is she? And why is she prom queen? You've never even met her before. What about the actual prom queen? Did she like not get prom queen or she did? And there was multiple? Like, is it give a piece to the crown to the girls? Like what? It makes no sense. Now also cast your mind back to how Cece was introduced as Jason's ex. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. The writers must have been like, oh shit, oopsie. Forgot that we did that. <laughs> we get this weird scene where Cece says to Ali, oh, I know what you're gonna say. It's screwed up that I dated my brother. And then she says that nothing happened, but that's not how the character was introduced. It was that whole intense summer thing. And they kind of had to backtrack and make other shit happen in that summer to make the summer intense, apart from whatever could have happened in the relationship. I want to know if there was like a continuity expert involved when they were writing the plot of this show, because maybe it was Friday afternoon and they clocked off early when the CC plot line was being written. Cece tells Allison she had planned to tell her everything after the summer in Cape May, but Bethany ruined it. Fucking Bethany. Remember the summer in Cape May is where Allison thought that Wilden got her pregnant and there's also the photo of Cece, Wilden, and Allison on a boat that apparently Melissa took? Remember that? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Cece says that Bethany found out that Jessica was sleeping with her father and she snapped. She stole Cece's clothes. Remember Cece had the matching set to whatever Allison had. She stole Cece's clothes and snuck out of Radley to go kill Jessica. This explains why Bethany was wearing the crusty yellow top. But then I'm also confused because the timeline of this implies Cece was still in Radley because Jessica bought Allison the crusty yellow top not long before Labor Day weekend. So then what is happening timeline wise? Cece Cece went on a holiday to Cape May with her pseudo boyfriend brother Jason and Allison and then what? She just went back to Radley? Wouldn't Jason know? It's just such a mess. Anyway, we see a flashback of Cece wearing a black hoodie and hitting a blonde girl in the crusty yellow top on the head with a rock. She thinks it's Bethany because she went to stop Bethany from killing Jessica. It's actually Allison and Jessica saw the whole thing. Oh my god. Ah. No, because that's just iconic. You need to appreciate that right now. I need you to sit and think or stand. I don't know if you stand while watching YouTube videos, kind of weird, but you do you. This explains why Jessica says, what have you done while burying Ali? Because both Jessica and Cece both think that Cece has just killed Allison. No, we can't unpack that yet because back in Avengers Tower, Tony Stark, Iron Man, Lair, Mona starts crying because she realizes she killed Bethany. Yes, bitch. Turns out the person who hit Bethany with a shovel was Mona, who thought it was Allison. Mona wanted to scare Allison for all the fucked up shit that she did to her, but she mm, hit her a little bit too hard. But remember, the shovel only actually knocked Bethany unconscious and then Melissa buried Bethany alive because she thought Spencer had hit Allison. As insane as it is, it's just so good. Like it's so excellent. Like that is so like, can you imagine? that on the big screen. Imagine cinema vibes, cinema vibes. You're watching, you're having a popcorn, maybe frozen Coke or frozen Pepsi. Depends what rights they have. And then this shit's unfolding on the screen. We need that. We need that. I'm available. I'm available. I can help you write it. Let's just unpack that part of the night while we're here. Allison was hit with a rock. 
Cece did that. Cece thought she was hitting Bethany to stop her from hurting Jessica. Jessica saw the whole thing. Jessica buries Allison alive to protect Cece. Bethany was hit with a shovel. Mona did that because she thought she was hitting Allison. Bethany's buried alive by Melissa, who thinks that Spencer hit Allison. She didn't know that Allison was Bethany. That's some shit, right? That is just like, that is. Mm. Mm. Back to the story. Allison tells Cece that Jason saw her wearing the crusty yellow top that night. Remember that plot point from season three ish? Yeah, it turned into a plot hole. Their way of fixing this plot hole is having Cece say, well, he didn't. It was either Allison or Bethany. Because when I tell you I was screaming and crying, fighting for my life, trying to make sense of this plot or writing my notes, it was the fight of my life. Time for another flashback. Jessica gives officer Darren Wilden money to say that he saw Cece on a highway outside Radley. So does that mean this whole time, Wilden knew that Cece was the one that killed Allison, even though his job was to find out who killed Allison? Even if he didn't explicitly know that Cece had killed Allison, he still had information that Cece had been at the De La Renta's house that night and had done something wrong to the extent that Jessica paid him to take her back to Radley. So either he's a mega shit evil demon of the century detective or he's a victim of messy writing or maybe both. There are actually so many huge gargantuan plot holes here but whatever let's just keep going. Cece says that back in Radley they took away her out privileges but then the craziest girl showed up. She says that the craziest girl shows up. She's referring to Mona. She's so crazy and quirky. Now remember that Mona thought that Cece was Ali. Plot hole alert. Plot hole alert. Ren told the girls that he admitted Cece as a visitor to see Mona because Cece could help Mona work out how to forgive Allison, but now we're learning that Cece was actually a patient at Radley at this time. Whatever. Cece says that hearing from Mona what she did to the girls was the only thing that she looked forward to. This next bit's kind of confusing, so I pulled an explanation directly from the PLL fan wiki, so shout out to the contributors of the fan wiki. Cece tells Ali that Mona wasn't ready to end the game, and Cece made a deal with her. If she helped Cece get out of Radley, she would play the game with Mona because she needed Mona's help to stay gone. Cece says her first assignment was making friends in Rosewood, and this is when Cece meets the girls for the first time in season three. Remember they have a little chat, blah, 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 and then, mm, we get this atrocious green screen of Cece watching them from the outside of the cafe. Back in real time, Cece tells Ali that Mona told her the liars were happy Alison was gone and it pissed her off. So I guess that's why she became a question mark, question mark, question mark. I actually nearly started crying writing my notes because I was so frustrated about how long it was taking me to write all the shit down. Cece says she knew that if Ali was actually alive, she'd show up to help the liars if there was trouble. So she orchestrated my arch nemesis plot point, the fucking lodge fire. Cece says she sent a decoy red coat, the third red coat, who is Sarah Harvey. So Sarah was also a red coat when Cece needed her to be. Does this mean that Sarah wasn't kidnapped and volunteered to be a menace? or was kidnapped, put in the dollhouse, and got Stockholm syndromed into helping her captor run errands as Redcoat. But then if she was kidnapped, who the fuck kidnapped her? Because it happened the same weekend Allison disappeared, but Cece was in Radley without privileges revoked. Goodbye. Cece says Sarah was sent to be a decoy for Mona, who thought she was going to find the identity of Redcoat. We know that, we remember that. Cece trapped the girls and forced Allison to turn up, but then Shana turned up and fucked the plan up. <laughs> this is referring to the fact that Shana started the lodge fire, which we knew. Remember that the girls thought that Ali saved them? Well, she did. And Cece heard them say they saw Ali. So at that point, she knew Ali was alive and this was fantastic news because she loved Ali and was really upset about potentially killing her. Now back in real time, remember Ali's trapped in the cell at Radley. She says, why did you keep playing the game if you cared about me? Listen, Cece says that when the Lions thought they killed A in New York, it was the perfect way to end it. So she left the country to start over, but realized the game was like a drug and she was really good at playing it. That seems inconsequential and whatever at the moment, but at the end of season seven, in the last episode, that actually adds a lot. Cece admits to doing things such as nearly freezing Spencer and Ari to death, driving the car through Emily's house, but she says she never actually heard them. I never actually heard them though, did I? Um... You're going to jail. You're going to jail. You kept five girls underground in a basement and tortured them for three weeks. One of them for five months. Like no, excuse declined. You also drugged Hannah and did surgery in her mouth so you could put a little piece of paper in her tooth as an A message. Babe, you blow up a house. Oh my God, okay. Cece says she killed Wilden and that the Black Widow at his funeral was Sarah Harvey. 
screaming and crying, yelling and shaking, convulsing with rage. Back in the Avengers Tower, right, the girls break out of the room to go save Ali, but Mona stays back to hear how Cece's story ends. Cece tells Ali that before she went to New York to meet up with Ali, remember that Fitzgerald theater drama? She went to say goodbye to Jessica, but when she got to the Dillarenta's house, she found Jessica dead. So this means that Cece forward slash A did not kill Jessica. Back in real time, the girls have made it to Radley, right? They're looking around trying to find Allison and they find Floppatron Sarah Harvey next to barrels of explosives. They're gonna try and blow Radley up. In the room with Allison, Cece tries to remotely detonate the explosives, but we see that the girls have shut that shit down. Allie comes running down the hall to them and she says, she's headed to the roof. Sarah tries to run off and Emily punches her. Slay. On the rooftop, Allison convinces Charlotte not to jump off and she takes off her hood and says, game over. Reference to the title, game over. The end of the episode is a few weeks later and we see the five girls packing up their cars to go to college. So after all that, let me summarize my thoughts on the mid-season finale and the whole Charlotte is A plot. I think the story is interesting and I like what they tried to do, but there were so many loose ends that trying to cover all bases with one character reveal was never going to work. I feel like Cece's motives for becoming A don't really make sense. As we learned before, it seems she became A because she didn't like how the liars were happy Allison was gone, but that information came from Mona, so that seems like a weak tip to go off, especially if Cece knew that Mona thought Cece was Allison. Also, I appreciate the writers giving Cece such a huge backstory that's heavily integrated in to the main plot, but it sort of feels like they're trying to excuse all the horrible shit that she did by saying, oh, Cece had it hard and she never killed anybody. I mean, she did kill Wilden. She never hurt them too much physically. Um, okay. Did she not kidnap, gas them, and then surgically implant trackers in their necks? Overall, yes, I think the CC plot is interesting. I think it's pretty good. It's pretty solid, but nowhere near as good as the Mona reveal. Also, side note, who knows how long the mums were trapped in the basement for, and who knows who put them in there? CC and Sarah were both at the prom at this point. So... There's also so much off-screen lore about how they got out, including Pam being naked and covered in oil. But that's too much for me right now. Now with season 6B, something interesting happens. We have a five-year time jump. The writers must have been in a tricky spot because the girls have been in senior year for the past three seasons and they need to graduate. But if they continued with the timeline as they had before, they would have had to have followed them through college all across America. So then by doing a five-year time jump, they can kind of find a reason to bring them all back. Wait, oh my God, we've got to do CC reveal. Mona is A1, CC is A2. We see that Allison is a teacher at Rosewood High and has stayed in Rosewood to look after Charlotte. A new character called Elliot Rollins comes into the classroom and lets Allison know that Charlotte's hearing date has been set. Now, Elliot is Charlotte's doctor. The four main girls are coming back to Rosewood to speak at Charlotte's hearing. Allison writes them all a letter before they get there asking that she come to her so she has five minutes to pitch release Charlotte. Now, where have our queens been? Spencer has been in Washington serving politician slay. Aria works for a publishing company and is dating this guy called Liam, and I think it's pretty serious. Hannah works for a fashion designer in New York and is engaged to this random Australian guy called Jordan. Look, as an Australian, I'm all for Australian representation but why are you Australian? Emily has been working as a bartender in California and she's been lying about attending the Salk Institute, which is like a research institute. Also Radley Sanitarium has been converted into a luxury hotel called The Radley, capital T, capital R. And guess who the hotel manager is? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ashley Marin. I actually love that whole thing. Like, come on, recycling set pieces. Veronica Hastings is running for state senate. Toby is building a house for his girlfriend, Yvonne, who is the daughter of Veronica's political opponent. Now, during the five-year time jump, Ezra has started dating... Why are my lights so low? Ezra started dating Nicole. Nicole is the Australian lady who worked with Emily and Haiti and came to Rosewood to recruit her for the Thailand trip, but Ezra ended up going. So we remember her, right? Well, she got kidnapped by revolutionaries in Papua New Guinea. I am not joking. Was that necessary? Like, why? We also find out that Emily's dad, Wayne, was killed in action in the five year time jump. And as a result, Emily has been struggling to see the point in anything. We later find out that after Wayne's death, she failed some classes in college, lost her scholarship, burned through her inheritance money, and is going to donate her eggs for money. Side note, it's a little bit unrealistic that Emily is the only one out of these 23 year olds that doesn't completely have her life together. I feel like they should all be flopping. I think we all flop at age 23. So now all the girls are back in Rosewood. Allison gives her little speech to them about how Charlotte is better now so they should all give court statements that they're not afraid of her so she can be released. Allison wants Charlotte released because she wants to have a family. Remember Jessica's dead. 
Kenneth is a flop and Jason's just all over the place. Allison says that Mona is going to be at the court hearing too, but Sarah isn't because she's not allowed to testify based on how her criminal charges were resolved. Whatever that means. At the hearing, Hannah, Emily and Spencer say they're not afraid of Charlotte, but Arya says she is and she doesn't want her release. Surprisingly, Mona says that she wants Charlotte to be released. Hmm. That night, the girls have shots, 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 shots at the Radley bar. And while they're at the bar, Allison texts them to say that Charlotte has been released. The girls wake up the next morning in a suite at the hotel that Ashley Marin has so graciously hooked them up with. Allison calls Hannah and says, Dr. Rollins brought Charlotte home that night and in the morning, Charlotte was gone. Where did Charlotte go? Dead. Charlotte went dead. Oh, we, oh, we, oh, we, oh, we, oh, we. We see Charlotte's body on the ground outside the church and it looks like she jumped from the bell tower the amount of falling from the bell tower in this show, the pushing down the bell tower, block the bell tower off. At Charlotte's funeral, the girls are all sitting there and guess who walks in? Sarah Harvey, wearing gloves, hmm. After the funeral, Lorenzo tells the girls that Charlotte's autopsy revealed she was murdered before falling and that they're going to have to stay in town to assist in the investigation. In episode 12, Sarah checks into the Radley. Hannah says that Sarah lied about having Stockholm Syndrome. Spencer says if she wasn't lying, then maybe she killed Charlotte out of revenge, so a potential suspect. Techno boy toy Caleb is back. So during the five year time jump, Caleb, hashtag Caleb, shippers, to the shippers out there, Caleb broke up, bad news for you. Hannah and Caleb broke up, Spencer and Toby broke up, Caleb and Spencer reconnected in Madrid randomly and now they have flirty vibes and Caleb works on Veronica's campaign as techno boy toy. I most definitely have thoughts on Spencer and Caleb being together, but more on that later when it heats up a little bit. Allison finds out that the police have discovered that Charlotte was murdered around 4 a.m. Hannah remembers that Aria left the hotel room around 3 a.m. So now they're like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, oh, okay. Well, okay, yeah, Arya killed Charlotte. False. Arya went to meet up with Ezra. Spicy, you're supposed to be with Liam. Also in terms of this whole dynamic, Arya works with Liam at the publishing company for boss lady Jillian. And who is the writer that they represent that they're chasing up for a book to? Ezra Fitz. Yes, Ezra Flops is now a successful author and Arya works for the publishing company that published his first book called Ostinato. <sighs> Anyway, Arya tells the girls about her Ezra meet and greet on the night Charlotte died and that she saw a blonde in a red sweater go into the church and she assumed it was Charlotte. Also mega lol, in episode 12, Arya is reading about Nicole's disappearance and there's an article and it says, Nicole Johnson. That is not her name. Her name is Nicole Gordon. PLL continuity team said, you know what? Season six, I'm OOO, I'm out of office. Don't contact me. Your email will bounce back. She's Nicole Johnson now. If you're looking at me and thinking, he looks different. He looks like he just did two hours of dance class and then had a shower. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So sorry about that. In episode 13, Lucas comes back and he's serving huge like multi-millionaire NFT metaverse vibes. Like this boy's rich and it annoys me. Why aren't more of these people just who they were, but a little bit older? Like why has everyone bloody changed the political landscape and stopped global warming by the 23? Like can everyone just calm down? Also it just occurred to me that I needed to put A's on Darren Wilden, Cece Drake and Sarah Harvey. Lucas catches up with Hannah and he's like, yes, I'm rich and you're a designer. Let's be business partners where I give you a lot of money and investors to start a business. Also, feel free to stay at my $7 trillion Rosewood apartment because I'm out of town a lot. Menace Melissa is floating around like King Boo and she picks up on the floody vibes between Spencer and Caleb. And she says that Spencer likes to shop out of other people's carts. I mean, she spilled though. Oops, I spilled. She is of course referring to the Ian and Ren dramas from season one. Also, Hannah picks up on the Spalab vibes and Spencer asks if Hannah's okay with her seeing Caleb. And she's like, yeah, go for it. Like I'm totally engaged right now to my Australian like business multi-trillionaire, like I'm fine, I'm not jealous. Mona has been working for Veronica's opponent and it turns out she approached the Hastings team and was turned back. So that means Mona and Yvonne actually work together. Sarah has been creeping around Rosewood and just generally turning up, just randomly being there whenever the girls are somewhere. And she keeps alluding to the fact that the girls should feel guilty about something. And we find out what that reason is. Apparently the night in Radley when Sarah and Charlotte tried to blow up the building and Emily punched Sarah, Sarah fell and touched some electrical wires and was electrocuted. So her hands got fried, which is why she was wearing gloves at the funeral. At the end of episode 13, the girls get their first text from Uber A, which is the third iteration and final iteration of A. I haven't put them on the board because I'll put the proper strings and arrangement up for 
season seven. The text reads, you know who did it and I'm going to make you talk. And instead of signing off with the dash A, the sign off is the demon emoji. Not the emojis, like just dash A. Like it's simple, it's delightful, it's tasteful, it's fashionable. Also from after the time jump, whenever a character gets a text, it used to be that you see it on their screen, but now they've put the words from the text on the actual frame around the character, which is a bit of fun. I like it, because then we get to see what the character's reaction is while reading it, and we get to read it at the same time. Now we're at episode 14 or episode 134 overall, and Spencer and Caleb bonked. So, let's talk about it. You might remember from part one, there was a piece of dialogue that I mentioned from Hannah, and I said, this will become more relevant later. Well, that's now. In episode 56, Hannah says, a best friend doesn't really date an ex, <laughs> which is exactly what's happening here. Now don't get it twisted. I don't hate Spaleb as a couple. I think they actually fit together pretty well because Spencer is 10,000 IQ living legend and Caleb is techno boy toy. So the characters make sense together. And also the actors have really good chemistry, but the whole besties ex-boyfriend thing, it's just like, do we not have enough going on right now? Also, Spaleb is a setup for living legend Dame Troy and Belisario. She was set up. Caleb's shippers were born vicious, I'm convinced. So the Spaleb news, mm -mm, mm -mm, it was bad for them, right? And I just know they launched an attack on cast and crew on socials, and I would not have enjoyed being Dame Troy during that. I'm skipping a lot of small details for the next few episodes because it's a lot of filler but basically this is what happens the new a thinks that one of the girls killed charlotte they think sarah is a and that ezra killed charlotte but he didn't and then they think that byron killed charlotte and he didn't byron was being shady which is why they thought that he killed charlotte but it turns out he's being shady because him and ella are back together again they get engaged and they get married again. I mean, good for them, good for them. Also, Emily is kind of on and off seeing Sabrina who sold Spencer the weed brownies five years ago. And she's now like the manager of the brew, but whatever, who cares? Spencer tells Caleb about the new A text. So now he's included in the squad. The four main girls plus Allison plus Mona plus Caleb, that's a solid squad. They cover a lot of bases. Yvonne is really nice and she gets along with everyone. So it's really not looking good for her staying alive wise. Jordan is also very nice and very accommodating to Hannah who's running around feral in Rosewood. But it's just so obvious that he is not gonna make it to the end relationship wise. Like it's just not, it doesn't make sense. It's not end game. There's a lot of exposition about Hannah's boss in New York who's a piece of shit and also Spencer doing research on political opponent Yvonne but it's largely inconsequential and adds nothing to the main plot so I'm not going to include it. Also Allison and Charlotte's doctor Elliot Rollins are now like very very flirty vibes and it turns out they were flirty vibes while he was treating Charlotte. That's how they met each other. And I am mentioning this plot line because unlike those other ones, this is important. Sarah randomly turns up at Rosewood High and tells Allison that she initially lied about how Charlotte treated her and that her and Charlotte were actually besties, okay? But then she looks like she's lying. So who the fuck knows what is going on? The Sarah kidnapping slash not kidnapping is so confusing. Speaking of Sarah, Spencer and Aria, they break into Sarah's room at the Radley and find floor plans of the Radley and Radley Sanitarium stashed in a drawer. They discover that Sarah's hotel room is actually in the exact spot that Charlotte's room in Radley Sanitarium was. And they find in the closet of Sarah's room, a hole in the wall that leads to a ladder. They go down the ladder and it leads to the old Radley Sanitarium basement. And they find a room with a desk that has switches on it that are the same switches that Charlotte made them use in the dollhouse to torture each other. There's also a narrow hallway, a filing cabinet, and a way out of the building, which explains how Sarah was getting in and out of the Radley undetected while stalking the girls around Rosewood. Um, let's take it back a couple of sentences, shall we? There is a hole in the wall that takes you down to the Radley sanitarium basement. Okay. In episode 16, Tanner tells Allison that the murder weapon used to kill Charlotte was metal, rectangular, and hollow, and asks if she's ever heard of a restaurant called the Two Crows. Apparently someone called Allison's house from the Two Crows the night Charlotte was released and died, and that the call went for three minutes. Allison didn't answer the call, which means that Charlotte did. Emily gets surgery to donate her eggs, but finds out a couple of days later that someone has broken into the facility and stolen her eggs. If you think that plotline is hectic, just you wait. 
for season seven. Remember how I said that these two are flirty vibes? They are now like mega flirty vibes. Like they're really just going fast. There's also this plot line about Melissa's suitcase handle that's broken. Spencer thinks it's the murder weapon. And then someone tries to run Emily over in like this giant car to get the suitcase handle or some shit. It's just exhausting. It's exhausting. I'm exhausted. I don't think there's enough concern, enough press media given to the fact that Sarah Harvey was accessing the Radley Sanitarium basement via hole in the wall. Speaking of the hole, in episode 17, the girls discover that the hole has been covered up and Sarah Harvey has apparently left town. At about this time in my rewatch, I wrote down the Charlotte arc is pretty good and interesting, but 6B is not good. These 10 episodes are not good, but I can't not talk about them because some of it becomes important later and also it's after the time jumps there's a lot of exposition. In episode 17 Elliot proposes to Allison and they get married immediately. Arya officiates the wedding, I don't want to talk about it, but these two are giving very much shotgun wedding. I think I'm gonna say it, I don't like what they did with Allison's character. She was absolute Thanos in season one to three flashbacks, like she had so many enemies. She was so iconically problematic, but then she comes back and then in season six especially, she's just a bit stale. Like I know she's been through a lot and she's gonna go through a lot more, but I just kind of miss the bitchy version of her. Okay, so remember how I briefly mentioned that there was a plot line of Spencer thinking that Melissa killed Charlotte with the suitcase handle. Spencer confronts Crust Lord Peter about it and he says that Melissa was being blackmailed and the person that was blackmailing her said they had video footage of her confessing to burying Bethany and we know that footage exists because she sent it to Spencer in season five. The blackmailing happened before Charlotte's death and I think before Charlotte could even get out of the facility. So Melissa has been royally pardoned. Basically she didn't kill Charlotte. Also Melissa is like a blackmail magnet. Remember when she got blackmailed to attend the masquerade ball in season two finale for absolutely no reason? Yeah, iconic, that's history. In episode 18, now remember Hannah is engaged to Jordan. It's her bridal shower now. Ashley invites Mona and she turns up with a really cute gift for Hannah, the dream wedding book that they made in eighth grade. The girls, including Hannah, are kind of like, boo, boo, tomato, tomato, why is Mona here? You all suck. How many times has Mona put her bacon on the line, her own personal bacon on the line to help you crusty people? And then you ice her out like this. Yeah, she tortured you for a couple of years, Get over it, we all go through things. They only talk to her when they want something and she always helps because she just wants to be included. In episode 19, Mona tells the girls that she is the one that called Charlotte from the Two Crows Diner. She said that since Charlotte was A, she knew every illegal thing the girls and Mona ever did. So she wanted to meet at the diner to discuss that but Charlotte's D never turned up. Allison and Elliot are at a bed and breakfast for their honeymoon, boring, boo, tomato, and Allison falls down the stairs, like she fucking sends it. She has a concussion and she goes to the hospital. The girls are starting to stress now, like it's not looking good for them. Allison fell down the stairs, Emily's eggs were stolen, things are starting to ramp up. Hannah comes up with a plan that she's going to confess to A that she killed Charlotte so that this all can end. Also, piece of contextual information from around episode 19, Sarah has checked back into the Radley under a false name and the girls think that she's looking for something. In hospital, Allison wakes up and sees her momager, Jessica, who we know is dead. So Allison's like, okay, wig, this must be a dream. Dream Jessica tells Allison that Elliot is gonna take good care of her. And Allison's like, yes, but it's a little bit weird. It's kind of out of nowhere. And of all the things that Dream Jessica would say, she says that, hmm. In episode 19, Aria tells Ezra about this new A, so now he knows. Also, they're writing a book together, but I didn't include that because I hate them. Basically what's happening is Arya is writing a book with the guy that she used to be in love with, uh, 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 Ezra Flops, about his relationship with his girlfriend that was kidnapped by revolutionaries in Papua New Guinea. I love how simple these plot lines are. Time for the season six finale, episode 140 overall, titled Hush Hush Sweet Liars. Allison wakes up on her couch and hears her jewelry box in her room playing Fur Elise. We love that, a classic. So she goes to investigate, hears a noise behind her, turns around and it's dead Jessica covered in dirt. Allison's having a little hallucination moment. And this was such a jump scare, okay? And the music was so loud. It's like, mmm, fair release, la 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 la. <laughs> Allison's like, okay, I'm hallucinating, let me go back to the couch. And the phone rings and it's Jessica's voice saying, did you miss me? Did you miss me? I know you wanna kiss me. All right, so this Hannah confession plan, she's working on it with Caleb and they're going for rat trap vibes. Now audience member, I want you to ask yourself, when has a Hannah plan ever gone to plan? 
never. Hannah texts A and says, yep, I did it, what now? And A replies like, cool, let's meet up, no police. Techno boy toy Caleb has Googled how to build an electric fence. And the plan is Hannah is going to be in a room at the Lost Woods Resort. You thought that place was done. No, it's back at the Lost Woods Resort. And when A comes to kill her for killing Charlotte, they'll be shocked by the electric fence. And if they see the fence, they'll still be caught because Caleb has put motion sensor cameras around the perimeter. Flawless, flawless, beautiful execution. If you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself that you don't have a techno boy toy, maybe you need to be the techno boy toy. Be your own techno boy toy. Back at Casa de Laurentiis, Alison is sleeping in the bed. She feels someone touch her hand. She thinks it's Elliot, rolls over, and it's Detective Wilden? She screams, obviously, and she's like, damn, these painkillers are doing a number on me. The next day, Alison sees dead Jessica outside the house pointing behind Alison. Alison turns around, sees dead Wilden, but this time dead Wilden has the gunshot wounds, remember? Wilden died in season four. Cece shot him, but Ashley was framed for it. And cause she actually, she kind of, she did run Wilden over, but we'll excuse it, we'll let it slide. She's a hotel manager now, right? We all have a past. Anyway, she went to jail for a little bit. Remember that? I think Ashley's jail era was a little bit iconic. Arya is now officially back with Ezra and it's over for Liam. I have to say it never really started for Liam. He made almost no impact. His debut didn't hit the chart at all. And he only got airplay because he had an Aria feature. Allison can't take any more of these hallucinations and she's run off. Emily's running around Rosewood looking for her and finds her in the church. She says that she can't tell what's real and what's fake anymore and she needs help. Okay, it's not looking good for our sis Allison D swag renters. Emily takes her to the Welby Psychiatric Hospital and Allison checks herself in. That's quite important. Allison checks herself into the Welby Psychiatric Hospital, which means some of the rights associated with ownership of things or something or something and something go to Elliot because they're married. At the Lost Woods, Hannah is starting to freak out about the plan and Caleb reassures her that there's no way A is going to get through all the trap layers he's set. The two of them have a little reminisce and there's flashbacks to the reason why they broke up. It's just a big misunderstanding. And back in the current timeline, Hannah says that she never stopped loving Caleb and they have a little kiss. Um, Ooh, sorry. Miss girl, you're engaged to Jordan. And Mr. Sir, you're hashtag Spaleb. Like, why are you hashtag Haleb at the moment? Spaleb fans screaming and crying. Haleb fans jumping for joy. Now, why A is distracted with this whole Lost Woods Hannah confessional situation, Spencer, Toby, and Mona are in the Radley basement looking for clues. They find some Radley sanitarium records, including a file for someone called Mary Drake, who was at Radley 25 years ago, had a child named Charles, who was later adopted by Jessica and Kenneth De Laurentiis. This is explosive. At the Lost Woods, Caleb gets an alert that someone is coming. So everyone except Hannah runs to the fence to see who it is, but no one is there. And they're like, shit. What about Hannah? They run back into the room and Hannah Steele's been abducted and it's absolute fucking scenes because they're like, how did this person get in and out without being monitored or seen or stopped? They look around the room and there's a fucking hole in the floor that leads to a tunnel by. Then the motion sensor camera footage from the fence loads and the person that was running to the Lost Woods Resort is Jessica De Laurentiis, question mark, question mark. Miss Lady is dead. Now the end of this episode is atrocious. Wilden walks into Allison's house and takes off his face. Yes, you heard me correctly. No, I did not stutter. Wilden takes off his face. We've gone from cute little Clay Allison masks in season three to hyper-realistic 3D print Mission Impossible masks in season six. The Wilden mask and hair comes off to reveal Elliot Rollins. He's standing next to Jessica De Laurentiis' twin, Mary Drake. He's standing next to her and he's talking and he has a British accent because in this show, British people are what? Say it with me, evil. Alison's in the hospital. Because she's married to Elliot and she signed herself into Welby, he now has 51% control of her assets, including the Karasimi Group, which was Charlotte's investment company and that has a shitload of money. You're gonna scream at this next piece of dialogue, okay? Elliot says, I would have done anything for Charlotte. And Mary says, you proved that when you married her cousin. When I heard that dialogue, I passed out. It's so funny. Mary says that they've taken back what was supposed to be hers. The last scene is the squad getting a text that says, thanks for giving me Hannah, you're free to go, AD. This is the first time that A has signed off as AD. So this all means Jessica De Laurentiis had an identical twin sister called Mary Drake, who gave birth to Charles in Radley. Mary and Elliot now have the Karasimi group and Charlotte's killer, or so they think. Also another plot point, Slay Queen Veronica wins the election and she's now state senator. Also something funny from after the time jump that I haven't mentioned so far is they incorporate video calls 
But the video calls are so bizarre. Like it's the most insanely staged video call that you've ever seen. Spencer will FaceTime Hannah and Hannah will answer in like 4K, standing perfectly still, phone set up on like a tripod. Bada -bada -bada, bada -bada -bada. It's just not believable at all. Now take a look at the PLL wall. Take a look at my PLL wall. It's the only one that exists. Like, let's not pretend that this isn't an art piece. So this is the state of play before season seven. I'm gonna go for the last time. Add the next season's lines. I'll be back in a second. I know you wanna kiss me. Breaking news. It's time to discuss season seven. I put on a jumper that has all the colors of the PLL strings on the wall. Season seven is purple. Take a look. Peruse. Oh my God, I nearly fell over. Uh, most of the purple lines link up at the top with that big question mark. And those lines are just so glorious and beautiful. Like that is just madness. And I did that live on TikTok. So nobody can say that I used a ruler because I didn't. I'm not enjoying that everyone outside can just see me. So let's just remedy that real quick. In terms of volume of yarn used, season seven was by far the most lines. You can see these are how I did it. Oh my God, behind the scenes. After doing all my notes on a season, I'll go through and write down all the links. Season seven had the most. I think maybe the next one was season two or three. I also have a fun little step ladder. I don't know if I'm going to be using it because then I reveal knee. And as you know, my channel is a knee free zone. Well, this is so risky. Oh, h and s, oh, h and s, someone call HR. It's the end of an era, but let's get stuck into it. Season seven is the worst rated season overall. And the last episode is the worst rated episode overall. I think what they tried to achieve was admirable. The plot points are good. They're exciting, but just the execution, they were limited in terms of trying to tie everything up with like an exciting reveal. You can see they had to have a character that was linked to all the main characters. So that was never gonna be easy. So my advice going into season seven is lower your expectations. That's my motto for life. Just lower your expectations. Also fun story. So season six finished, I think March, 2016. And then season seven started around June, 2016. And between that is Coachella. Also, Troyan's phone was stolen. So some guy found Troyan's phone and he was like posting Instagrams and like Snapchats and stuff. They got in contact and Troyan was really cool about it and gave this guy her Coachella passes and he ended up going backstage at Skrillex. Does anyone else remember that? All right, where's my stick? Let's play ball. The season seven premiere is called TikTok Bitches and it starts with the squad outside the police station and they're about to go in and talk to the police about the Hannah situation. Remember, Miss Girl was abducted from the Lost Woods Resort after Caleb's plan flopped. We aren't surprised though. Also, they saw someone who looked like Jessica on the surveillance cameras. So they're outside the police station and then they see Miss Mary Drake going into the police station. Toby goes into the police station, remember he is a police officer from Instant Academy, and he goes up to Mary and asks if he can help her with anything. And she says, she's the owner of the Lost Woods Resort and she would like to report a break-in. So she's up to something clearly. Then the girls get a text from AD that says, you've got 24 hours to give me Charlotte's real killer or Hannah dies, TikTok bitches. Next we see Hannah, she's in a barn of some sort and she's just wearing her underwear and she looks a bit bruised and she's covered in dirt. It's really not looking good for her. Ashley Benson was acting in these scenes. Wow, she said, I really wanna get an Oscars nomination. So now the gang has to try and work out who Charlotte's killer was. Now remember how Aria and Ezra saw a blonde in a red jumper going to the church the night Charlotte disappeared and they figured it was Charlotte? Well, Aria's like, maybe it's Allison and maybe Allison killed Charlotte. When Aria floats this idea of Allison killing Charlotte to the squad, we get this iconic piece of cinema history. Mona saying, maybe she snapped. Maybe she snapped. Emily doesn't believe that Alison could kill Charlotte after so much campaigning to get Charlotte out of Welby. So Emily goes to visit Alison in Welby. At Welby, she sees Elliot, Alison's husband and evil doctor, as we know. This guy is so Batman villain. He tells Emily that Alison's condition has deteriorated and she's had a psychotic break, so she needs to stay. Later that night, Alison is sleeping. Emily goes to visit her. And she says to her, did you kill Charlotte? And Alison's like half awake and she's in like a state. And she says, please forgive me. So Emily's like, cool. Okay, Alison killed Charlotte and there's proof. Meanwhile, in this old abandoned barn, Hannah is being sprayed with a hose and being zapped with a taser, like proper torture, like very dark for PLL. Don't forget, this is like on ABC Family or Freeform. Ugh. Let me sit on this chair. Later on in the episode, Hannah is asleep and she hears Spencer calling her name. So she wakes up and she sees Spencer sitting next to her in the barn. So she's like, okay, this is a dream slay. And Dream Spencer tells Hannah that she's going to be okay and that she'll find a way to 
will escape. Meanwhile, Mary turns up at Spencer's house, asks if Spencer is Spencer or Melissa, and when Spencer says Spencer, tells her that they met a long time ago but she wouldn't remember. Mary is looking for Spencer's parents but she decides to have tea with Spencer. Spencer asks why her parents never mentioned Mary, and Mary says it's because Jessica turned everyone in the town against her, and that she's back in Rosewood because she found out that Jessica is dead. Now remember that red sweater? Emily finds it in Allison's room in the Dillarenta's house and everyone's like, okay, great, Allison's safe and well be, so let's tell A that she did it, even if she didn't, because she'll be fine. Caleb drops the sweater off at the Lost Woods and texts AD, and this is AD by the way, texts AD that Allison did it and the proof is at the Lost Woods. Meanwhile, Hannah has escaped the barn and she's running through the forest and she finds a highway and she's trying to flag a car down. A car goes past, turns around and stops. Guess who's driving it? Three, two, one. Mary Drake. The end of the season seven premiere is Elliot next to Allison in her bed at Welby and he says to her, I'm going to make sure you live a long life rotting away in here, just like you. Karma can be a bitch. And he injects her with something. Overall, pretty solid premiere. Episode two, Mary drops Hannah off with the gang and she's like, what the fuck just happened? Why did Mary just let me go free? And they tell her it's because they gave her Charlotte's actual killer, Allison. So then AD had to give Hannah back. The gang isn't sure if Mary Drake is AD or is working with AD at this point. Emily gets a random phone call and it turns out it's Allison calling from one of the nurse's phones and she's begging Emily to come help her and we can hear the nurses trying to take the phone out of her hands. Emily goes to Welby to check on Allison and the nurse tells Emily that visitation rules have been changed and only direct family can visit Allison. Now interestingly Allison's only family in Rosewood at the moment is her crusty husband Elliot and random surprise twin aunt Mary Drake. Like it's real bad for Allison right now. Speaking of Mary Drake she tells Spencer the reason why she went to Radley in the first place. When she and Jessica were 14 Jessica was babysitting and the baby wouldn't stop crying so she asked Mary to come help her, but when Mary got there, the baby was quiet. Jessica left to meet a boy, so Mary stayed at the house. The parents got home and found the baby had drowned in the bathtub, and Mary got blamed, even though Jessica did it. Again, pretty dark for a PLL episode. Oh my god, also, in episode two, Hannah ends her engagement with Jordan. Like, I forgot that shit was happening. He was so irrelevant. Now, with the visitation rules in mind, Emily asks Mary to go with her to go check on Allison, and Mary agrees. They get into Allison's room, and Dr. Elliot Rollins turns up, and he's fucking fuming. He sends them out and pulls Mary aside and has an argument with her in this meeting room and Emily can see them in there and she's like, whoa, 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 dum 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 How do they know each other? By episode three, the girls have realized that Elliot is sus and they're like, shit, we really fucked up. We gotta go save our girl, Allison. They go to the dealer enter's house to see if they can find any evidence that confirms their suspicions that Elliot is sus and crusty and they find his Mission Impossible mask making tools. Now around this time, Caleb and Spencer, Spaleb, hashtag Spaleb, if you will, and you will. They're having major relationship issues and Spencer thinks that Caleb still has feelings for Hannah and he's like, no, I don't. But he most definitely does considering Hannah and Caleb just kissed in the season six finale. In episode three, there's a plot line where Hannah and Arya go to an Amish farm to get information on Elliot and a random Amish girl tells them that Elliot used to go there with Charlotte and that they were couple vibes. Like, I'm sorry, what is going on? Why are the Amish involved? But now they know that Elliot and Charlotte were together, which is further sus that he ended up with Allison. Elliot discovers that the girls have found his mask making toolkit and he goes to Allison to drug her and take her out of the facility. Like a getaway runaway type deal. When Elliot's driving them out of town, Allison manages to steal his phone and send her GPS location to the girls. And the girls are like, shit, we should go follow. So Hannah's like, I'll drive, let's take Lucas's car. All right, I'll drive. Put your seatbelts on, psh, YOLO. Allison escapes Elliot's car. Elliot chases her through the woods on foot. He runs across the road. Hannah runs him over and he dies. His death is so dramatic, oh my God. It's like his face goes through the windshield so he's like and then Hannah's like here and it's like very close I'm telling you the drama in season seven is real oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. also the fact that that isn't the most gruesome death of season seven is sick and twisted in episode four the girls bury Elliot's body in the woods and they decide that the best course of action for them is to make it look like he skipped town they are being set up by themselves. It's just clown behavior, okay? Just go to the police and deal with the vehicular manslaughter charge. Like, aren't you tired of running around and being all shady all the time? Now, after burying the body, Arya sneaks Allison back into Welby and the plan is that Spencer is going to use Elliot's credit card to purchase a train ticket and then wait at the Radley bar for a text from Arya saying that Allison is sorted and that Spencer will go put Elliot's jacket and phone on the train. Now, interestingly, Allison tells Arya that she did follow Charlotte into the church that night, but she did not kill her. She says that 
they had an argument, Alison left and Charlotte stayed. Aria and Hannah go to Elliot's burial site to get rid of evidence and Lucas's car with the smashed windscreen is gone. Now remember that Spencer is at the Radley bar waiting for the text from Aria that Alison's at Welby. While at the bar, Spencer has drinks with a man named Marco. They have flirty vibes and they end up hooking up in the elevator. In terms of shipping rules, you know, at this point, Spaleb is just pretty much over. Haleb is mid-resurrection. And on the Toby side of things, he gets engaged to Yvonne around about episode three or four. Arya and Hannah are at the burial site and Mona turns up with the car. She went and got the windscreen replaced and she says she knew something was going to go down because she's been tracking Elliot for a couple of days. Like she's just like an icon and a legend. Mona says to the girls, where's the burner phone? And they're like, excuse me, um, no idea. What are you talking about? The way Mona saves these girls every three to five business days and they still treat her like an old vacuum cleaner. The next day, the girls plus Mona are having brunch at the Radley to make them seem normal and not like they just murdered someone the night before, which they did. <coughs> and guess who walks into the hotel lobby? Three, two, one. Jenna motherfucking Thanos Marshall. Her entrance is so extremely iconic because they put this ridiculously dramatically loud echo boom sound whenever she puts her stick on the floor. Miss Jenna is 100% back on her villain bullshit and she's insinuating that she knows what the girls did. Season seven is really giving Rosewood reunion special. It's actually ridiculous. Five year school reunion in the renovated sanitarium the day after running the British man over. Now remember the boner phone. Boner phone? Remember the boner phone? Burner phone. Mona finds the burner phone and it's ringing and she answers it and guess who's talking on the other end? Jenna Thanos Marshall. My immediate line of questioning is why is Jenna evil? Like, do you really not have anything better to do? Anyway, more on that later. In episode five, I'm pretty sure that Arya's hair changes and it really threw me. So if you go through and watch these episodes, can you keep an eye out for that? Mary Drake is back and apparently looking after Alison at the De Laurentiis house because the only way Alison could get out of Welby is if a family member is with her. Okay. So call Jason. Look, I think Mary Drake is a really interesting character, but the sudden Mary Drakeification of Rosewood is just a little bit hard to swallow, especially since she only got introduced like five episodes ago. Now Miss Mary's about to tell a tale. Mary tells Alice that Elliot tracked her down in Europe and told her Charlotte was dead. They bonded over Charlotte and then she says that he manipulated her into working for him. Can we believe this though? Probably not. At this point, there's no reason to trust what she's saying. Mona hacks into Elliot's burner phone and discovers that Elliot texted someone the night he abducted Alison from Welby. And he also said that he knew that Alison didn't kill Charlotte. Now back in her own house, Alison discovers that Elliot took all her savings and her shares of the Karasimi group. As I said before, it's really bad for our girl Alison D. Swag Renters at the moment. Spencer discovers that Marco from her hookup at the hotel bar is actually Detective Marco Fury who's in charge of the Elliot Rollins case. Now at this stage, the police are buying the lie that Elliot is alive and skipped town. Oh my God, yes, it's finally time to talk about this. In episode five, we get one of my top three most atrocious lines of dialogue in the entire show. Jenna is at the Radley and meets Sarah Harvey. The two of them have flirty vibes and Sarah offers to buy Jenna a drink and she says, are you a sour girl? You a sour girl? <laughs> oh my God. Are you a sour girl? Are you a sour girl? Now back to business. Later on at the bar, Jenna and Sarah are still having drinks and guess who turns up to meet them? Three, two, one. Noel Khan. Again, do you have nothing better to do with your life? I'm convinced that Noel's character had no reason to stay in the show beyond season one, but they wrote him into the plot lines to keep the actor on the show because the actor's hot. At the end of episode five, Ezra proposes to Arya. Boo, boo, tomato, tomato. La Polizia discovered that Elliot Rollins is actually Archer Dunhill, who is wanted in the UK for fraud and he was masquerading as a doctor that died 75 years ago. Speaking of masquerading, Masquerade by Nicki Minaj is a great song and deserved more. Mary thinks that Elliot is still alive and is coming back to kill her. Again, we can't be sure if we're buying what she's selling. We don't know if secret Radley twin Mary is lying or not. In episode six, Jenna reveals that she and Sarah are both looking for Charlotte's killer and that she and Charlotte became besties and she was helping Charlotte look for Mary. She says that Elliot fake married Allison so that he'll get Charlotte out of Welby and he was actually in love with Charlotte. Okay, no. Plotline declined. Jenna and Charlotte being besties makes no fucking sense. In season five, Cece tried to drown Jenna. Do you remember at Paige's like party for Emily at her aunt's house? And it's not like, oh, Jenna didn't know it was Cece. Jenna knew that Cece tried to kill her and she was scared of Cece, told Shana, and Shana told the girls that Jenna was afraid of Cece. This is disastrous. My world is crumbling. Next we see Sarah Harvey and our girl is in distress. She's packing her suitcase in a hurry and she opens her hotel room door and she's serving 
shocked face. The end of episode six is a maid finding Sarah's dead body in the bathtub of her hotel room. Oh, eh, oh, eh, oh. RIP to Sarah Harvey, a flop from start to finish. Also, the Jenna Marshall curse is alive and well, unlike Sarah Harvey. Ooh. Pretty much every character that Jenna flirts with over the series dies. Um, quick sanity pause. What happened to the secret pathway to the secret underground sanitarium basement under the hotel? Like, did everyone just forget about that? I guess no one cares anymore. Also, why isn't the police more suspicious of this sudden twin of a dead lady that's living in the dead lady's house? And in terms of Sarah Harvey, what's her vibe? What's her story? Is she good or bad or both or what? I would appreciate it if one of the main characters would just break the fourth wall to tell the audience if Sarah had Stockholm Syndrome or not. It's so confusing. In episode seven, Jason is back and he's giving Jesus slay with long hair. He kicks Mary out of the dealer enters house. Thank God. And Allison is like, OMG, give Mary a chance. Allison girl, you're flopping. In flashbacks, we find out that Jason and Arya dated for a bit in the time jump. I actually loved that pairing post time jump because before when he like kissed her, it was still weird because she was in high school and he wasn't. But post time jump, I actually like these two together. Like imagine if they stayed together and got married and Arya became a Dilarentis. Can you imagine the drama? Spencer and Hannah break into Jenna's room at the Radley looking for clues, but then they hide under the bed when they hear someone come in. They see someone open a box and put Mary Drake's Radley file in it. That person is... Noel Kahn. Now, this show is, in fact, going to give me an irregular heartbeat. Literally, what reason is there for Noel working with surprise twin Mary? Speaking of Mary, she reveals that she actually saw Jason relatively recently. Remember when Jason fell down the elevator shaft, disappeared, tried to crash at Aunt Carol's, but Jessica was there, wouldn't let him into the house, and he thought he heard a noise of someone inside, thought it was Charles. Turns out it was Mary Drake. Yes, Miss Mary Drake was inside the house. Jessica knew about this, didn't want Jason to see Mary. Now, during her little story time, Mary also mentions that there was a storm seller at Aunt Carol's that Jessica would disappear to a lot and Allison's like hmm. The girls go to Aunt Carol's storm cellar and find pictures of Allison and the girls all around the cellar and it turns out Jessica had been looking for Allison since her disappearance and was keeping tabs on all of the girls. She has files on all the girls except Aria. Miss Aria, you're a killer and not Ezra's wife. There's also a file on Mary Drake which reveals that she had another child at Radley and this unknown child would be the same age as the squad. After the girls leave the storm cellar, it blows up. Like very Mission Impossible vibes. At the end of episode seven, it's revealed that AD has Aria's file. That will become important later, don't forget it. In episode eight, the character that ruined my life Grunwaldsty, she's back. She comes to visit Hannah at the Radley. She tells Hannah that she had a dream of her surrounded by darkness and that the threat is still very close to her. Now at this moment, Noel turns up in the Radley lobby Grunwald freaks out and her nose starts bleeding. And then that's it, there's no more Grunwald in the show. Thanks random lady from Ravenswood. The purpose of this scene and plotline was to infer that the person who tortured Hannah in the barn was Noel Kahn. Hannah then goes on the Noel is a warpath using the psychic lady evidence, but the girls aren't really buying it. Emily gets a job as swim coach at Rosewood High and guess who gets a job as the athletic supervisor? Three, two, one. Paige McCullers. Free these 23 year olds from Rosewood, I swear to God. In episode nine, Hannah goes on X Games mode and dis Ooh. She decides that she's going to trap Noel herself because no one believes her. Hannah tells everyone that she's going back to New York, but she's actually in Rosewood orchestrating this plan. Yes, Hannah's plans never work and they usually make everything worse for everyone. But you can also tell that she doesn't want to include anyone in on her plan because she cares too much about them and doesn't want them to get hurt. So she thinks that she can do it all herself. This girly, she believes in herself too much, I'm afraid. Can I stand? Hannah follows Noel and sees him dump a bag of rubbish in a bin. She goes through it and finds Sarah Harvey's phone. So Noel Kahn killed Sarah Harvey. Hannah uses the phone as bait and tells Noel to meet her at a bar. She's planning to drug him and kidnap him, I guess, but logistically, how would that work? Meanwhile, Spencer and Emily decide to do some Noel Kahn research and they break into the Kahn cabin. They find a USB that has files called Spencer, Aria, Hannah, and Emily. In each file is footage of Noel helping Charlotte set up the dollhouse antics, including pouring red paint on Spencer so she thinks she killed someone. So that means Noel helped Cece in the dollhouse. This makes almost no sense. Why would he hate them so much that he would help kidnap and torture them in an underground dollhouse? And he was in school at the time. He has no motive. Ugh. Anyway, the USB ends up being stolen from Spencer's house. Blah, blah, blah. 
No evidence, they can't go to the police, blah blah blah, the usual. The end of episode 9 is Noel going to his cabin, seeing Hannah's hat on the floor, going to pick it up, and Hannah whacks him on the head with the bat, or something. He's knocked unconscious and Hannah has him, okay? Now it's time for the season 7 mid-season finale. This is titled The Darkest Night, with a capital A on darkest, and let me just tell you, it is absolutely bonkers. It's truly so hard to describe how one feels after watching this episode. It's truly an out of body experience. But every time I think about this episode, the more iconic it gets. The episode starts with Hannah strapping an unconscious Noel to a chair in a random like motel looking building. And we see that the girls have told the police that Hannah is missing and that Noel took her. So now the police are involved. Mona is randomly back, thank God. Dame Troyan was carrying hard, but now Janelle's here to help. Hannah calls Mona to help her because she wants the police to think that she's fine, but she wants to hurt Noel for what he did to her in the barn. Keep in mind Hannah doesn't know about the dollhouse USB receipts at this time. Basically this whole Hannah Mona situation is that she doesn't want the police to think anything is weird, find Noel in the motel and arrest him because she wants to make him suffer more than a prison would make him suffer, if that makes sense. This episode is just like boom after boom after boom, okay? Allison tells Emily that she took a pregnancy test and it came out positive. Dun dun dun. Also blah blah blah, Emily's having flirty vibes with old flame Paige McCullers but doesn't really go anywhere eventually so we don't really need to talk about it at all. Remember when Paige tried to drown Emily? Yeah. Oh okay, yeah. Now get this! Remember Ezra's ex Nicole who was kidnapped by revolutionaries in Papua New Guinea and was presumed dead? Well Miss Nicole is alive. They find her at a rebel camp. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Arya's like, well shit, it's over for me. Ezra's gonna cancel the wedding. Toby tells Spencer that he and Yvonne are leaving Rosewood and moving to Maine. And there's like a weird scene where Spencer asks Toby for one final kiss goodbye. And he's like, um, okay. Hannah tells the girls about her Noel situation and they go to see him and he has escaped the motel room. They get a text to meet at a location to swap the dollhouse USB for Noel's silence over the fact that Hannah just tried to kidnap and torture him. Oh my god. Okay, meanwhile, at the Radley, Caleb and Mona are talking and guess who comes up to them, gives them a drink and says, compliments of Jenna Marshall. Three, two, one. Sydney. Why? Noel, Sydney, and Janet need to get a life and leave Rosewood. My blood pressure is so high thinking about what happens next in this episode. It's actually so iconic. The girls go to the designated meeting location for the swap and it's an abandoned blind school. Turns out Jenna and Noel never just planned on doing a cute little Facebook marketplace swap. They brought them there to kill them. Okay, all right, come on, focus. Just to give you some context on the blind school geography, Hannah and Emily are upstairs with Noel. Arya, Spencer, and Allison are downstairs with Jenna. Also, Jenna has a gun. She's walking around with the gun, turns the lights off and says, now you'll see what I see. Like I'm absolutely flabbergasted. The way season one is just like, I got a text and season seven is blind Thanos Jenna trying to kill five girls in a blind school. But this is not the pinnacle. See, it's about to get more outrageous. Noel finds an ax and goes after Hannah and Emily upstairs. They tussle, he falls on his ax and he gets, wait, I don't even know if I can say this on YouTube. No, <laughs> as in his head comes off, clean cut on the floor, rolling down the stairs. He falls on an axe, his head comes off, rolls down the stairs. My God, okay. Oh, we oh, we oh. Absolutely the most ridiculous death in the series. Now downstairs, Jenna is walking around trying to find the girls to shoot them, okay? We hear gunshot noises and see Spencer bleeding out, but Mary Drake is there and she's holding Spencer. Troy had really had me believing she genuinely got shot. I can feel that you're thinking that the episode is done. No. Mary reveals that she is Spencer's birth mother. The episode ends with Jenna seemingly being abducted by AD and Toby and Yvonne get in a really bad car crash. All right, let's summarize the events of this episode, shall we? Allison is pregnant. Noel is dead after falling on an ax. Jenna tried to shoot five of her ex-classmates in an abandoned blind school with the lights off. Mary Drake is Spencer's mother and Toby and Yvonne get into a really bad car crash. Cool, 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 cool. Everything is fine. It's all going great. See, the thing about this episode is that it is so ridiculous that it is extremely iconic. And I know this is a big statement, but I think this mid-season finale is a better finale than the actual series finale. It's just so pretty little lies. Like what other show could pull off stupid shit like that. Okay, episode 11, let's keep going. 
It's now a week after the events of the mid-season finale. Toby says that the crash is because of a deer and Yvonne is now in an induced coma. A BBB, a big black box, arrives at Spencer's house and the girls open it to reveal a custom board game called Liar's Lament. It has little player pieces that look like each of them and the game board is rosewood with model buildings and there's a phone in the middle of the board sitting on top of an eight piece jigsaw puzzle. Now this board game concept is so excellent and it gives me dollhouse vibes. And yes, of fucking course, I'm still mad that the dollhouse only really lasted for two episodes we were robbed. But at least now the Liar's Lament custom board game has dollhouse vibes. Initially the girls leave the board game alone because they don't want to start it. Marco tells Spencer that there were two guns present at the abandoned blind school and the missing gun Spencer was shot with was not the gun that Jenna was holding. In other news, Aria is doing wedding planning as she goes to a caterer and guess who the wedding caterer chef is? Three, two, one, Holden. His irrelevance, it astounds me. Now remember the whole Mary Drake saying, Spencer, I am your mother. Spencer confronts Veronica about it and Veronica says that it's true and that Mary tricked Peter into thinking that she was Jessica. Peter is such a fucking crust, like are you joking? This man truly could not keep it in his pants, right? He slept with both twin sisters. The PLL dads are just on a whole nother level of crusty. We'll do a little family tree analysis at the end of the video. Also, why has no one mentioned Mary Drake prior to the season six finale if so many characters apparently knew of her existence? AD texts Spencer and tells her to play the game to get more Mary info. Spencer has to do truth or Dare and she picks Dare. Why would you not just pick Truth? The Dare is that she has to go visit Toby in hospital, which is pretty chill. Also in my notes, I wrote down that this is the episode in which Toby unflopped. This is the unfloppening. I can't really explain what it was, but from this episode onwards, Toby is less annoying. That being said, he's absolutely not giving enough to the fact that his stepsister just tried to kill five people in an abandoned blind school. Anyway, because Spencer did her turn of the board game, the board game itself rewards her by spitting out a letter from the side of the board. It's a letter that Mary wrote to Spencer when she was born, which is just so lovely, isn't it? Also, Spencer gets the first puzzle piece. Now the girls have to keep playing the game. They can't not play the game because it turns out that AD has footage of them burying Dr. Rollins and will leak it if they refuse to play. Now remember that Emily, Paige and Alison all teach at Rosewood High now. Emily has dramas with a student that tries to blackmail her and the student exhibits very Alison behaviours and guess what her name is? Addison. Also Addison has four friends, does that sound familiar? This is infuriating. A character called Addison who acts like Allison. come on. Blah blah blah, Emily gets the second piece after dealing with the Addison blackmail. Ezra keeps flying between Rosewood and New York to visit his rescued ex Nicole and Arya is mega pressed but Ezra assures her that he's just helping Nicole until he can tell her that he's engaged to Arya. Spencer still has flirty vibes with Marco at this point and she asks him if the police can focus on finding Mary Drake because Mary is her birth mother. Mary disappeared after the blind school situation. Jenna turns up with a story that puts the blame for all of these recent events on Noel and he's dead so he can't defend himself and say that it's a lie. Jenna says that Charlotte left money for Jenna's eye surgery and Sarah's hand surgery and apparently Noel was after the money and killed Sarah for it. There's something about him having no money because he got cut off from his family's money. The girls don't know if this is true or if Jenna is making up shit but if it was true it would kind of make sense because it would explain why Sarah was looking around the Radley basement because she was looking for where Charlotte had stashed her money. But then again Jenna and Sarah only met a few episodes ago so their connection isn't strong. I don't know but I also don't really think it matters and there's no point trying to make sense of it. There's only like seven episodes left. In episode 13, Yvonne wakes up from her induced coma but has complications and dies. Oh, we, oh, we, oh. Now Yvonne was set up. This was so, so, so unnecessary. Yvonne absolutely wall the grip. Yvonne absolutely did not need to die. Clearly they're trying to get the original couples back together and killing off Yvonne gets her out of the picture for Toby but come on, none of the other partners had to die. This is what I wrote down because this is what I think happened. The writers were clearly like, oh shit, we need Toby to be single, but we don't want Yvonne to leave him because he was cheating or whatever, because that would make him look bad. So great, let's kill Yvonne in a car crash. It's actually ridiculous. Anyway, Hannah says Alison Rollins sounds like a mouthful of muffin, which is funny because it's true. It's Hannah's turn on the board game and AD says that she has to wear a culturally inappropriate outfit to an important business meeting, but on her way to the meeting, Caleb tries breaking into the board game box and gets sprayed in the eye with some chemical and has to go to the hospital. Hannah misses the meeting to go see him and therefore skips her turn. Aria 
and Emily confront Sydney about the weird drink shit from a couple episodes ago, and she tells them that Jenna told her it was a prank. A prank? Go to work, pay your bills. Why are you running around as a 22-year-old doing pranks on 23-year-olds? Sydney says she answered a phone call from Jenna and got sucked into the drama. Whatever, lady. As punishment for Hannah skipping her turn, AD sends Marco Elliot's decomposing finger. Remember that Marco is leading the Rollins case. Episode 14, let's go. Peter Hastings is back and Spencer is squaring up for a battle. She roasts him for being a cheating clown that didn't even come see her when she got shot and he tells her that he's been trying to find Mary Drake and hired a private investigator. Now Hannah and Spencer do some digging and they get an address of interest from the private investigator. Now guess who on the wall they find at this address related to the whereabouts of Mary Drake? Three, two, one. Pastor Ted. It turns out Pastor Ted and Mary Drake dated and had a child named Charles. So that means Cece's father is Pastor Ted. What? That's a collapsible reveal. And it's so ridiculous, like why? But that's not even all, okay? Ted says he helped out at like a Boy Scout type camp situation that Charles went to for a little bit. And guess who Charles's bestie was at this camp? Lucas. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Spencer and Peter have another confrontation about her getting info from the PI. And he says, Mary is so dangerous. And she's like, okay. So prove it. Peter says that Mary Drake killed her twin sister Jessica for hiding that Charles was Charlotte and was not actually dead. Also, I think this means Peter knew about Charlotte way before everyone else. Anyway, it's now Allison's turn of the board game and she's told that she has to go to a mystery location that ends up being a baby clothes store. It triggers traumatic memories from her being drugged up by Rollins at Welby and the woman at the store says that she had to put aside a gift for the egg donor, Allison looks at the gift. It's a necklace that says Emily on it. This means that Ace stole Emily's eggs, fertilized one, and surgically impregnated Allison against her will while drugged up at Welby. This is so ridiculously fucked up. Oh my god. This has to be the most insane thing that happened on the show, apart from Noel being. <laughs> oh gosh, how are we doing after that reveal? Anyway, Allison gets her puzzle piece. Aria gets a video call from a deep fake version of herself holding her file from Jessica a storm seller at Aunt Carol's and saying if what was in the file came out, Ezra would go to jail. She later gets a text to meet AD, goes to the location, there's a limo, she gets in the limo and AD is Sydney. Psych, Sydney's wearing an earpiece and being blackmailed and being told exactly what to say. She's saying shit like, I shot Spencer. No, babe, you didn't. We'll find out more about the Sydney situation in the finale. Basically, the point of the meeting was for A via Sydney to convince Arya that if she didn't want to play her turn with the file, she had to join the A team. Episode 15, and it's Emily's turn again, and Arya hasn't had a turn at this stage that they know of, so they're all up in arms fuming about it. Emily and Allison get blood tests, which reveal that the eggs are in fact Emily's, but the father isn't Elliot, and they don't know who the father is. Post Pastor Ted reveal and Lucas information, the girls are like, yep, okay, Lucas is AD, shut it down, shut it down! They find a comic book in his apartment called Arcturus that is about psychological torture and has things like the dollhouse switchboard in it. Hannah shows Mona the board game and our 20,000 IQ queen is obsessed, like Addison Ray levels. Remember that she's got some stuff going on upstairs, which means she could get addicted to something like this, and showing her was a bad idea because she starts regressing to evil Mona. Now back in Spencer land, Spencer thinks that Mary wants to meet up with her at the Lost Woods to talk, but Mary never turns up, but Marco followed Spencer and tells her that Archer Dunhill's credit card was used the night he disappeared at the Radley bar where he and Spencer were hooking up. Uh oh. Flashback to drunk Spencer at the bar paying for drinks with Elliot's card and signing with her name. It's not looking good for her. Arya is having video call after video call with AD who's getting her to do all types of A-team shit such as go and steal the Arcturus comic from Lucas's apartment. And at this stage Ezra Flops is still going between Rosewood and New York to help Nicole and Arya is is getting increasingly shitty. Now this is an interesting scene. At the airport, Ezra sees Spencer talking to a man with a buzz cut who turns out to be, three, two, one, 
Ren Kingston. Spencer calls Ezra over for a drink and he says, no thanks, love, I'll pass. Spencer then pulls Ezra aside and says that Ren is on a layover and she's trying to get info from him and not to tell anyone that he saw her. It's a really out of nowhere awkward scene, but it does become important. Let me tell you that by about episode 16, I was done like trying to condense this plot into a concise format, it was getting really hard. So now the girls have to deal with the situation that Spencer signed the receipt with her name after using Elliot's card. To make a long story short, Caleb and Hannah flood the records room of the Radley so all the receipts, including Spencer's, are destroyed. It's also Hannah's turn of the game again and she has to pick up a hard drive from a computer shop and all it has on it is a Patsy Klein song. She has to drop the drive off at a locker at the school and Mona's like, oh, I'll help you. Also so why are you blocking me out again? She literally says, I'll help you and your friends like I always do and then crawl back under a rock. How many times do I have to save all of you until I'm finally part of the group? AD makes Aria destroy the nursery that Emily and Allison have set up in the De Laurentiis house and she's like, yep, yep. Cool, sounds good, I'm willing to do that. Emily and Allison nearly catch her in the act. The next day the whole squad's in the nursery like, what the fuck happened? Emily and Allison are really upset and Aria's like, Zip my lips like a padlock. She says nothing. Girl, Ezra flops is not worth it. Let AD give the police the file. Arya's logic doesn't really make sense to me and it also highlights that almost all of Arya's plot lines involve who she's dating. Like all the girls have plots related to who they're dating, but I feel Arya's ones are always about her relationships and most of her plot lines are about Ezra. So her choosing Ezra over the girls doesn't really sit right with me. These girls have always been here for you and he wrote a book about your friend that disappeared and then dated you for research. And all of this happened while he was your teacher. Anyway, the girls interrogate Lucas and he says he knew Charles, but didn't know Charles was now Charlotte. So he's not AD because of fucking course he's not. <sighs> Anyway, so with the whole Emily eggs Allison pregnant situation, they're spending a lot of time together and they're having flirty vibes. Now remember back in school, they were flirty vibes, but now they're like very flirty vibes. Hashtag Emerson guys, am I right? Emerson Endgame. Episode 17, what's in the file? I can hear you asking, well, let's find out. It's a police report that Aria wrote about Ezra being a statutory, uh-huh. Starts with R, ends with I-S-T, which she wrote when it was revealed Ezra had been writing a book about Arya and her friends. So like season four area. Marco is now all up in everyone's business trying to solve the Rollins case, like he's all over the receipt situation. We find out that the night Mary killed Jessica, Jessica and Peter were actually planning on killing Mary. What else happens in episode 17? Caleb and Hannah get engaged. The number of engagements in this group of 23 year olds can everyone calm down, but also we knew that hashtag Caleb was always gonna be end game, so the engagement is not surprising at all. Arya finally gets her reward for being AD's minion and it's a big puzzle piece and when she puts it on the board, she gets her letter back. Uh oh, what's that? Mona saw Arya getting the puzzle piece. Episode 18 and the police have search warrants to seize shit from all of the girls' houses. Tana is back and has taken over from Marco who has excused himself from the case because he had feelings for Spencer. Now Miss Tana, she is just so eager to lock the girls up because she's always felt they were guilty of something. Toby's now back in Rosewood post Yvonne death and he has S-E-G-G-S with Spencer. Now remember that the Liars Lament board game came with a phone. The phone gives them an ultimatum, choose or lose, just one plea, the rest go free. If no one steps up, you all go down with a 36 hour countdown. Mona reveals to the squad that Arya has been working for AD and the girls are pissed. Arya is like full on dramageddon, sugar bear hair canceled. Hannah and Caleb get married in like a little mini ceremony at the judge's office. Here slays the bride. As the countdown passes 24 hours, everyone's just getting it on, aren't they? We've got Hannah and Caleb, Ezra and Arya, Allison and Emily and Spencer and Toby. When the timer hits zero, Arya decides that she's going to make it up to the girls by driving to the police station and confessing to killing Elliot. And then she finds his dead body in the boot of her car. Side note, the police are so hell bent on solving the Elliot Rollins case. They're giving almost nothing to the Jessica De Laurentiis, Noel Kahn, and Sarah Harvey deaths. Episode 19, penultimate episode, let's go. Arya's like, wait, the body's in my car. That's actually very slay and helps my confessional. But when she's walking to the police station, she's stopped by Ezra Flops, who says he knows how to get rid of a body because he has a master's degree in American literature. What the fuck's that supposed to mean? I have to leave, bye. I hate that man so much, it's unreal. 
Let me just close my mouth and mind my business. Anyway, Ezra and Arya get back to her car and the body is gone. Remember that Mona was starting to regress to A vibes? Well, now she's really ramping up the A vibes and the girls are getting suspicious. She gets a text from AD to meet at the Two Crows. So Hannah, Caleb and Spencer follow her there. They confront her at the Two Crows about her potentially being AD. And she looks like she's starting to lose it. She's saying like, no, 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 somebody took the game from me. And then she runs off to the bathroom. They chase her to the bathroom and she's not there. Where did she go? There is of course a secret door in the bathroom wall that leads down to a tunnel. Spencer and Caleb go into the tunnel while Hannah drives back to Rosewood. Later in the episode, Hannah's in Rosewood and she sees petals coming from the church bell tower. She goes up to the bell tower and sees Mona there and Mona's in like full nerd Mona get up. There's a bunch of flashbacks and action, but it's revealed that Mona is the one that murdered Charlotte. Mona knew that Charlotte was faking being better. She called from the two crows to meet her at the church via secret tunnel and confronted her. In the flashbacks, Mona implies that Charlotte is going to go back to hurting people and Charlotte's like, yeah, what about it? Who's gonna stop me? You and what are me? Charlotte taunts Mona about how the girls will never love her. Mona pushes her into the wall and Charlotte's neck is pierced by this square shaped metal protrusion which kills her instantly. And then I guess Mona pushes her out of the window. Meanwhile, back in real time with nerdy Mona and Hannah in the bell tower, Mona's having a hard time distinguishing reality and thinks that Hannah is Charlotte and tries to push her out of the window again, but Spencer and Caleb arrive from the tunnel and stop her. So the tunnel goes from the two crows to the church. When they get out of the church and they go back to their car, they find the last two puzzle pieces waiting for them. Now I am wondering, wouldn't Mona's fingerprints be on Charlotte's body? But I guess we are ignoring that. So now that they've got all the puzzle pieces, the board game tells them the grand prize is at Aunt Carol's and they think it must be the Archer Dunhill's body buried in the fake Charles grave, but when they get there, they're standing above the grave and Tana and the police arrive. Uh oh. At the police station, it's looking real bad for the girls, right? And then guess who comes in and confesses to the murder of Archer Dunhill and Jessica De Laurentiis? Miss Mary Drake. This confession means the girls are now off the hook. That's the end of episode 19. And I have to say, Miss Janelle Parrish, she killed it as Mona in this episode. Like, wow. Okay, everyone, it is now time for us to go through the series finale of Pretty Little Liars. The episode starts with Mona in Welby waking up from a dream, seeing someone and saying, I never would have guessed it was you. Are you here to kill me? Boom, sudden one year time jump right at the start of the episode. Ezra and Arya are discussing how their award-winning book might be turned into a movie. It's also their wedding week. Alison and Emily are together and they had twins named Lily and Grace. These babies slayed their acting roles, good for them. Now important character introduction. Spencer has a horse named Bashful. She's at the stables with Melissa and Toby turns up and it looks like he's been backpacking post Yvonne death. Now this is important. Bashful only like Spencer and gets angry around anyone else. Now this next bit, I wouldn't have included it if we didn't get this iconic one-liner. Allison's teaching at the school and we see supreme evil flop Addison again. She's put a doll with a hearing aid and a knife through its chest in the locker of a deaf girl classy. Jenna Marshall arrives in the school hallway. Turns out that she's the new life skills teacher. She tells Addison to leave. Addison makes a blind joke and Jenna says, prepare yourselves. I may not be able to see but I can smell a bitch a mile away. Get her, Jenna. That's iconic. That is iconic. Like, admit it. Look, yes, I have several questions such as, is Jenna at all qualified to teach? Also, weren't you literally evil and trying to murder people in an abandoned blind school? Like, do we just forget about that? But there's no point in asking these questions because it's the last episode and we will literally never get the answers. Mona is being let out of Welby and Hannah is going to let her live with her and Caleb and Caleb's not having a bar of it. Hannah feels bad that her forcing Mona to help with the game triggered a relapse. But also, why can't Mona go live with her mum? Arya and Ed Ezra have their bachelor and bachelorette party at the Lost Woods, which Spencer and Allison now co-own because Mary gave it to them. The whole squad's at this bachelor slash bachelorette party and Melissa Hastings is there with a black hoodie on watching them through the bushes. Pause, wait. Melissa pulls her face off to reveal Mona, the fucking latex masks. Oh my God, I hate them so much. That night while asleep at the Lost Woods, Arya gets a call and finds out that she can't have kids. Why is she getting this call at 2 a.m. in the morning? Oh, okay, let's keep going. Focus, everyone, it's fine, it's fine. We're doing great. The next day, Spencer goes to visit Mary in prison and says, Mary, I need your help with something. Then it's Ezra and Arya's rehearsal dinner and Hannah brings Mona and everyone's like, boo, boo, tomato. Now get this right. The party is being catered and some of the high school kids work for the catering company, including some of Addison's friends. 
one of whom is Sydney Sweeney. Sydney Sweeney was in Pretty Little Liars. Also apparently one of Addison's other friends is Maya's niece or something, which is a cute little throwback. Remember Maya New? That was fun. Miss Arya, you're a killer, not Ezra's wife. I mean, <gasps> Wow. Miss Arya, you're a killer and Ezra's wife. Anyway, back at the rehearsal dinner with the Addison friends, Emily tells them that Addison is a bully and they don't need to be friends with her. And then the friends say, you don't say no to Addison, she'd have to be dead first. I don't like where this is going. Also at this rehearsal dinner, the mums talk about being locked in the basement and it's like a cute little like, we were trapped in the basement and Pam was covered in oil. Later on at the De Laurentiis house, Alison proposes to Emily, hashtag Emerson Endgame, hello LGBTs. At Spencer's, she's in the bathroom. She can hear someone on a piano playing Fur Elise. She goes to investigate and it's Mona. Mona says, deja vu bitch, and knocks her out. Very similar to the season two finale, which as we know, one of my top five episodes. Mona knocks Spencer out and Spencer wakes up in this glass cell and she's looking in this mirror on one of the walls. And then the reflection starts moving. It's not a mirror, it's a glass. Oh. Spencer has an identical twin and the twin is behind the glass. Now I'm speechless. There are so many twins on this show, I cannot. Miss Mary Drake is also there and she says, we didn't think you'd wake up so soon, Spencer. Then there's randomly a scene of Ezra in the lobby at Radley running into Spencer, but we know it's not Spencer because Spencer's in the cell. It's Spencer's evil twin pretending to be Spencer. Okay, back to Spencer in the cell. It's time for the AD reveal. Are you ready, everybody? Spencer's twin is... Alex Drake. Miss Alex Drake is British. Now remember, anyone in the show that's British is evil. Alex says that she was bartending and Ren came in and thought that she was Spencer. Ren then tells Alex about Spencer and everything that's going on in Rosewood. Alex says that her and Ren became an item and he'd already broken up with Melissa for the 70th time at this stage. By the way, this means that Ren has dated all three sisters. Okay, now we need to talk about the accent. Troy Belisario deserves an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar and Tony and a knighthood for all of her amazing work on Pretty Little Liars, excluding this Cockney accent. Yeah, I guess you could say he has a tie. Would you like a sedative? The accent, it gives me pause. Let's just say that. And as a Spencer Stan, as a Troyan, like I would vote Troyan into galactic presidency, it hurts me. But I will say Troyan does an excellent job at being Alex being Spencer, because in the scenes when Alex is pretending to be Spencer, there's like a slight slight difference in the accent. Okay, back to the story. Alex then reveals every time that she's impersonated Spencer so far. So we have the weird kiss before Toby left with Yvonne to go to Maine, the airport run-in with Ren and Ezra, a couple of hookups with Toby, and the dream that Hannah had while being tortured in the barn. It wasn't a dream. Alex was impersonating Spencer. In terms of Alex's motives, she says she was avenging Charlotte's death and also wanted what Spencer had in terms of like friends and family. In flashbacks, we see Alex telling Ren about her plans to absorb Spencer's life and Ren's like I feel weird about this it's not good I'm getting bad vibes from this but then she asks him to shoot her so she can get the same gunshot wound as Spencer post blind school and he does it timeline wise I'm all over the place didn't AD shoot Spencer because Jenna didn't shoot Spencer Mary didn't shoot Spencer none of the girls shot Spencer Noel was <laughs> So then Alex must have shot Spencer. But then does that mean she went back to London to get shot by Ren and then came back again? Anyway, Alex says that she wanted Ren to be her partner in crime and help her kill Spencer, but he always saw her as Alex because she was trying to impersonate Spencer. So instead of breaking up with him, she killed him and turned him into a necklace. Turned his ashes into an eternity's time. I don't know what to say. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. RIP to the hot man, I guess. He turned into a pretty nice looking necklace though. Okay, next we have Spencer staying in the cell while Alex goes to be Spencer at the Ezreal wedding. At the wedding, Alex holds one of the Emerson babies and whispers, oh my God. <laughs> Are you ready? Like, I don't even know if you're ready. She whispers to the baby, you have your daddy's eyes. I knew Ren would make pretty babies. Oh, it's bad for me right now. This means that the sperm donor for Allison and Emily's babies was Ren Kingston. When 
did Alex Drake get the sample? It obviously would have had to have been before she killed him, but then also after Emily had her eggs stolen. Okay, back in the cell. Mary tells Spencer that when she had Alex and Spencer in Radley, Spencer was adopted by the Hastings. Alex was sold so that Mary could get out of Radley. Baby Alex goes to a couple in England, but she had issues. So they put her in an orphanage and she ran away when she was 10. Mary and Spencer hug and this gives Spencer an opportunity to steal a bobby pin from her hair. Back at the wedding, Arya is in the trenches because Ezra texted her saying he's not coming to the wedding. <laughs> Hey, sorry, not coming to the wedding. But it turns out he's trapped in a cell in the same facility as Spencer. Ezra says he asked fake Spencer some questions in the Radley lobby. She freaked out and knocked him unconscious and took him to the cell. So she did all this while everyone in the lobby was watching? Like, what is the logistics here? Also, I'm sorry, but I do not like Arya's wedding dress. Also, it's just so wrong to me that Hannah didn't get a fancy wedding with a fancy dress and blah, blah, blah. Like if any character on this board wanted to have a fancy wedding and ceremony, it would definitely be Hannah. Next, we have Alex coming back to the dungeon with more context. She reveals that she really just wants Toby. Like she wants to be with Toby as Spencer. Alex also reveals that she blackmailed Sydney into working for her because she found out Sydney was stealing from the bank she worked for. Okay, sure. She says that Jenna worked with her for money for surgery and Sarah worked with her to find Charlotte's greatest treasure, thinking it was money in the Radley basement, but it was actually the Mary Drake file. Okay, so this means Jenna was telling the truth, but then it just takes away Jenna's motive for wanting to kill all the girls in the abandoned blind school. It's just, gosh. The more layers you scratch away, the more issues there are. So we are not gonna scratch. We then finally get Alex and Charlotte flashbacks. Charlotte leaves Rosewood with Archer, who we know as Elliot Rollins, and Ren sets up a meet and greet for Charlotte to meet Alex. Apparently they all become besties and the four of them spend a lot of time traveling around Europe. I am kind of confused about when the fuck this is all happening though. I guess it has to be after the season five premiere when Cece goes to Paris, which means Ren would have to have known Alex before that. While in Europe, Charlotte is having A withdrawals and went back to America to be A again. She tells Alex that she'll be back, but she never will come back because she gets caught and spends the next five years in Welby. Now back in real time, Alex is still Still pretending to be Spencer. She goes to the stable with Toby and Bashful is having absolutely none of her, which is suspicious because Bashful loves Spencer. The way this horse was the first being to discover that Spencer wasn't Spencer, an icon truly. Now guess who the first person was to find out? Three, two, one. Jenna Marshall. Jenna runs into Alex slash Spencer and she smells different because she's wearing a different perfume, but she doesn't admit to it upon questioning. So Jenna calls Toby and says Spencer isn't Spencer. It's so ridiculous. The next scene, however, is trenches. Let me sit down for this one. Like I'm losing steam, my God. Toby meets up with the squad and they all just suddenly go along with this realization that Spencer isn't Spencer and has an evil twin that's impersonating her. Mona's there too. And she says that Ren came to Welby to kill her. So now she's playing the game to beat Alex. Question Question mark, question mark, question mark. When did Ren visit Mona? It would have to have been in the last year because Mona's only been in well before a year. This means that Alex turned Ren into a necklace in less than a year. Also, why would Ren suddenly become evil and agree to kill Mona? It's just weird, it doesn't make sense. At this point in the finale, Alex is in the secret dungeon and she drops the line of the season, potentially the line of the series. Hello, sister. Hello, sister. Anyway, the squad works out where the dungeon is located and apparently it's in the house that Toby was building mid season six. He sold it to a mystery buyer when he and Yvonne agreed to move out of Rosewood. So I guess that mystery buyer was Alex Drake. Ezra and Spencer escape from their cells using the bobby pin that she stole from Mary's hair. They run out of the dungeon facility and make it outside. However, it's a fake outside. Yes, audience member, they're still underground in a cavern that's painted to look like they're outside. Alex discovers they escaped and chases them into the fake outside and smacks Ezra. She tries to kill Spencer with an ax and then the squad turns up through the actual house. I think the architectural situation going on here is like you go into the Toby house and then there's like a passage down to the cavern with the fake outside and then that's where the entrance to the dungeon is. But then the entrance to the cavern from the passage is like a fake house. So there's like a dungeon in a house in a house. Logistically an absolute nightmare. What's the zoning law situation in Rosewood? Are they just like, yep, okay, cool. Here's your excavation permit. I'm sorry, when and how did Alex build all of this shit? There surely would have been contractors and everything. So no one ever said anything. It's evil. 
It's just evil, there's no other explanation for what's going on right now. Okay, so the squad turns up in the fake outside. Toby has a gun, but both Spencers are in front of him and he doesn't know which one to shoot. He asks a question about a poem he and Real Spencer used to love. Real Spencer gets it right and Alex is arrested. The police arrive and Alex and Mary are taken into custody. Next we have Arya and Ezra's wedding and Arya's wearing a different dress to the first one and I hate it less, but I still hate it. They get married, blah, 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 but guess who the photographer is? Marlene King. Yes, slay Marlene. My favorite thing about this wedding is that Mike isn't there. <laughs> Like, why are you at your sister's wedding? The third last scene of the show is like a final farewell to our main girls. Hannah says that she's pregnant and Arya says that her and Ezra are going to adopt. This is so accurate and realistic and true to life because me, myself as a 26 year old, I've been married twice and I have seven kids. Come on, I can do it, We're so close. Second last scene reveals that Mona lives in Paris and owns a doll shop with a secret basement where she's keeping Alex and Mary Drake in a life-size dollhouse. Yeah, okay. How did Mona get them out of police custody? Unless it was fake police. The police officer that arrested Alex in the fake underground is the same guy that Mona is apparently in a relationship with in Paris. So that checks out, that makes a little bit of sense. The very last scene of this show is one that makes me incredibly angry. Addison and her four friends are having a sleepover in a barn and three of the friends wake up to Addison missing and the fourth friend comes back into the barn and says Addison is missing and she thought she heard a scream. No. No. I refuse. I rebuke. I rebuke the evil from them trying to reboot the show in this manner. Absolutely not. Not on my fucking watch. The Addison Allison shit makes me so unreasonably angry. Like, I need to chill out, but I can't. Anyway, that's it. That's the entire plot of the show Pretty Little Liars. I cannot believe we've made it through. Let me zoom out so you can get like a glimpse of the scale here. Let me stand next to this. It's huge. Basically all of our main girls end up happily married and having kids, except for Spencer, who's been in the trenches the most throughout this show, and in my opinion deserves a happy ending the most. I don't like Ezria. Emerson is like meh. I do actually like Caleb, but controversially, I think I liked Spaleb more. My favorite characters are Spencer and Mona, 100% no contest. And then probably the next tier would be Caleb, Hannah, Emily, and maybe even Jenna. Worst characters, Ezra, Grunwald, Shana, Addison, Bethany. Best episodes in my opinion would have to be Dollhouse 1 and two, Halloween Train, season two finale, and then A is for Answers in season four. There are a lot of really good random episodes, but I would say those are my top five. There's also the Blind School episode with the ax and the shooting, which is so ridiculous, it's iconic. Worst episode's kind of hard to do because there's so many and I would feel bad. In terms of seasons, I think season four and season two are the best ones. Actually from best to worst, I would say season four, season two, season three, season five, season one, season six, and season seven. Let's quickly go through the complicated De Laurentiis Hastings family tree. Allison's parents are Jessica and Kenneth. Jason's parents are Jessica and Peter. Spencer's parents are Mary and Peter. Melissa's parents are Veronica and Peter. And then Cece's parents are Mary and Pastor Ted. Allison and Jason are half siblings. Jason and Spencer slash Alex are half siblings slash cousins because they have the same dad and their mums are sisters. Allison and Spencer slash Alex are cousins. Cece and Allison are cousins. Cece and Jason are cousins. Cece and Spencer slash Alex are half siblings. Melissa is half siblings with Spencer and Jason. As I said before, I would have loved it if Arya stayed with Jason and they got married because then Arya would be Arya de Laurentiis and she would be Allison's sister-in-law. Also, I didn't really mention this, but Ashley and Pastor Ted didn't end up getting married. But if they did, that would mean Hannah and Charlotte would have been step-siblings. And if those two things happened, that means all the five girls would be in the same fucked up family tree because Allison and Emily are married and have kids. In terms of character endgames, I do think one of the main girls should have died or two of the lesser characters such as like Caleb and Ezra, like partners. Let me read you this idea that I wrote down as I was going through the plot and I thought this would kind of serve as an ending. With the Ezra reveal, it would have been interesting if we got the Radley history stuff that Spencer had at that time and we gave it to Arya because then when she finds out about Ezra, she could flip, absolutely lose it and kill him and then she becomes A 
but because of her hypothetical condition, she doesn't know that she's the one orchestrating the bad stuff happening to her and her friends. Then in a hypothetical fifth and final season, it would be the girls dealing with that and maybe Arya dies at the end. And I think that would work, especially because there's a scene in season four or five where Eddie Lamb, the guy who works at Radley Sanitarium, he says that Arya looks familiar and that never really goes anywhere, but it could go somewhere with my plot lines. I feel like at this point, I know so much about this bloody show that I could write an ultra slay fanfic, but I just do not have the time. I have the ambition. I truly do. I just don't have the time. So what do you think? Do you like the ending of the show? What would you have done different if you were given the opportunity? What's your favorite episode? Who's your favorite character? Let me know in the comments. Also, I wanted to make prints of the wall with the pictures and the lines between the characters and everything. And I know a lot of you have been asking me about that, but I can't really sell prints of it as is because I don't have like rights to the photos. So I'm making like an artistic representation of the wall. So that's being worked on at the moment. Um, and when I have more information on that, I'll talk about it on my Instagram and maybe post on the community tab. I can't believe this video series is over. It's genuinely been three months. Like that's not even a joke. It's been three months. Thank you so much for joining me through this appropriately unhinged recap of Pretty Little Liars. I absolutely did have a lot of fun and I hope you all did too. I plan on making more long videos like this throughout the year. So keep an eye out for those. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you all soon. Peace out. Bye. I know you want to kiss me. Yes. Yes. Yeah.